Among countless bodies, soldiers, and comrades, he alone stands and can only watch. The giant he thought dead speaks, noting that it didn't calculate that there would be such a strong human. This giant is named Ahayut, and after he suddenly popped up in the Empire 20 years ago, along with other two giants, they destroyed everything in their path, for no apparent reason. Because of him, more than half of the Empire turned into a mass grade, yet he still dares live after all this? Ahayut tells him not to worry, as soon he will return to his side. He notes that it's good then, as his dear friends will wait for him on the other side. One was torched because of an extremely angry dragon, and the other was sealed for eternity by a mighty mage called Lorahan. Doesn't he get it? They lost. Ahayut tells him to not cover his words with sweetenings, as the children of the star share senses. He knows their opponents were also eliminated, and it means that strong people like himself no longer exist on this world. He notes that he's still alive and kicking, so what is he babbling about? Ahayut says that he shouldn't hope for much, as he feels his time is reaching an end. However, he's quite glad, as if he realized his skills and put body and soul into training, he would have become too large of an obstacle to deal with. He tries to retort this, but he knows that he had a life not worth living that much, so he should just die. With his final moments, Ahayut congratulates him for being a great human, and he should be proud. But soon, his world will be engulfed by the starlight and disappear entirely. He cuts off his head in one clean swing, leaving him alone. Things have already happened as they did. What can he possibly do now? With heavy breath, he walks around the battlefield and thinks of his comrades and the cherished memories he made with them all of this time. Among a pile of bodies, he spots one of his friends and wonders what kind of pride they had to let themselves fight to this extent. They should have noticed that they aren't on the same level and lived. He closes his eyes and wonders why only his sword worked on a giant that could deflect the Empire's strongest sword aura. If he did it some other way, if he only he knew about this, they wouldn't have died a dog's death. But now, nothing can be done. Suddenly, he hears someone talking, and he walks towards it. He is quite surprised to see the great commander, Adishan, still alive, although barely. He tells her that for someone of her status, she shouldn't be like this. She says otherwise, and tells Ronan that he's a corporal, so he isn't keeping appearances either. But what's more important right now? Is a Hayut dead? Ronan confirms it, and notes that his body isn't far away from here. Tears roll down Adishan's face, and she thanks him for doing this. Ronan says that if she's that grateful, she should listen to his request at least. Usually, soldiers like this are either abandoned here or buried randomly, but he wants them cleaned up and treated well. Adishan says that he looks more alive than her, so shouldn't he be the one to do that? He begins coughing up more and more blood. He is definitely not more alive than her, as he could die at any second. He was a fool and in turn fooled around, but it still feels quite unfair that he will die. Adishan asks what he wants to do if he were to live, and he says that he would do lots and lots of things. But now, the only thing he can think about is the academy. That big and ugly bastard kept reminding him of it, as his sister's only wish was to see him at the academy. But soon, he will be reunited with them. Adishan tells him to not lose hope, as a search party will soon be here. But he doesn't believe he will be holding out much longer, as he's on death's door. The rain suddenly stops, surprising them both. The ground begins to shake uncontrollably, and when Ronan looks in the sky, he spots a being with eight wings. Behind it, countless giants are ready to attack. Adishan's whole world is in shambles, as in the end, she couldn't save the world this time either. Ronan snaps her out of it and tells her this isn't the time for thinking, as she should hurry and use telekinesis on him so that he can fight. She's very surprised he's still willing to fight in this situation, and he notes that even if he dies, he will not give those bastards the reward of killing him while he's still. She finds his valiance quite comforting and thinks that this man was the missing piece in all of this. She gets up and suddenly kisses him as to transfer something from her mouth. She whispers something to him, and Ronan asks what she means, especially in this type of situation. Adishan notes that if he ever sees her again, he should tell her to not do anything dumb and become a tailor, as she always wanted to try. Those words are the last of humanity, as with them, the whole world is wiped out. The blue orb glistens, and Ronan wakes up screaming for her, but she's nowhere to be seen, as he has woken up in his hometown Nimbuton. This is his first day of regression. He sits under a tree's shade, and can't believe that Adishan's last words were true. What she told him was that this orb that she gave him allows the person holding it to regress back in time. That's how she, a simple tailor woman, became the Grand Commander. The orb allows a person to regress a total of four times, and she already used three of those, so only one regression remains. She's handing it to him, as she believes he's the key for humanity's salvation. He needs to sharpen his abilities as much as possible, and the best place for this would be Philian Academy. 
Ronan slams his head in the tree and wonders just what he's supposed to do by himself, even if he has this much time. Suddenly, he remembers that this is in fact the past, so he rushes to see his older sister. While running towards his home, he spots that some punks are bullying a child by tying him upside down. That's when he notices that the child isn't held up by a rope, but rather by magic. Such a person would be invaluable in the battlefield, to think they were in a countryside town like this. Come to think of it, around this time, he's sure they were here as well. The person holding the child up thinks that he didn't want any of this, and something bad will certainly happen to that poor kid soon. He begs them to stop, as he doesn't have any money, as his mother's medicine is too expensive. The bully notes that is not for him to worry about. He slaps him constantly, and says that if he wanted to be a filial son like this, he should have earned more money. He tells the guy with magic to put the kid at the top of the three, as he hasn't come to his senses quite yet. He tries to refuse, but the bully says that he's acting like a girl, as it's not like they are hanging him or something. He should shut up, and do as he says. Asel wonders why things became like this. Was it perhaps wrong to learn magic? He only wanted to show everyone that he's good at something, so he needs to tell this bully that he can't do it, but he's too scared to. He still finds the courage to try, but that's when someone hits him with a stick over the head. Ronan is the perpetrator, and tells them to stop, as that child will die if things continue like this. The kid falls, and the bully is extremely mad at a cell for letting him go. He tries to defend himself, but Ronan gets in front, as he has to talk with him about something. With the bully being quite angry, he's getting ignored. Where did he learn telekinesis magic? Acel notes that he learned it from a grimoire she bought from a peddler. He's quite surprised Acel became this good with such a cheap book, so if he trains, he will certainly become extremely powerful. That's when the bully draws his sword, as he has had enough of people ignoring him. It seems that he's acting this way because he let him win that day, but now, he will teach him manners. Ronan wonders how this guy managed to get a real sword, and notices his posture is extremely bad, but he's strong, so things like this should work around these parts. Naturally, with him, they will not. Although his body is much younger, what was imprinted into him while he was a disciplinary soldier remains. Battle sense. The bully notes that it must be his lucky day, as he was going to make sure he wouldn't be able to lift a spoon for his whole life. Since it became like this, he should drop to his knees instantly and beg, as he will let him go with only an arm being cut off. Fair deal, right? And if he somehow dies, he will make sure his sister is treated well. By him, that is. Ronan asks if he just talked about his sister, and the bully laughs and confirms it. Every time he sees her, he thinks of how great her body is. With one angry swing, Ronan takes his ear clean off. The pain takes a while to register, but when it does, he cowers in fear and pain. Ronan comes closer to him and asks if he really wants to die today. The bully's friends wonder how he managed to cut off his ear with a mere stick, and Ronan demands they leave with this bastard in tow, lest they want to become like him. They will also leave behind the money they stole, as well some more for ruining his mood. They can only agree. When they leave, Ronan gives the bullied kid all of the money, as he only needs the sword. He also shouldn't worry about their bullying anymore, as they won't have the confidence to wander around like this anymore. He thanks him profusely once again, and a cell grabs their attention. He also apologizes, as he knew that what he did was wrong, and he shouldn't have, even though Hans threatened him. He apologizes again and again, but the bullied kid sighs, and notes that he was crying like this the first time he was dragged here. When he saw him, he only thought that they were in the same situation, so he shouldn't blame himself, as it's not his fault at all. With that, he leaves, and Ronan looks at her, as apparently, he's the only one that knows she's a girl somehow. He asks her if she remembers that they had some business to talk about, and she confirms it. He notes that they will be meeting in four days, as he's busy right now, so they will meet then. Oh, and if she thinks of not coming, she knows what will happen, right? Acel is quite puzzled by this whole interaction. He arrives at his sister's door with some flowers, as he remembered she liked flowers. But is this perhaps too much? He turns away as he thinks he's doing too much, and that's when she opens the door and is glad he's back. While he was a disciplinary soldier, he thought to himself a thousand times. What does he say to her when they see each other again? Should he apologize for leaving without a word, or tell her how much he missed her? He thought about it very often, but those things could only be said by the soldier Ronan. All that he can say now is that he's back. Iris, his sister, prepares him a meal and is extremely glad that her cold brother actually gave her flowers. She asks if he wants more to eat, but he notes she's already given him plenty. Ronan also asks how old she will be this year, and she notes she will be 22, but why does he ask? He excuses this question as simply forgetting, and notes that if she's around that age, there are 10 years until those giant bastards come. She feels his forehead as to check for a fever, and he notes that she's still the same as she remembers, bright, kind, and warm. She's making him wish that this moment could last forever, 
but he isn't allowed this luxury, as he's the only one who can protect her and the world. He removes her hand and notes that he has something important to tell her. He was actually thinking of joining the academy soon. She is extremely glad he has come too, and rushes to get something out of a hidden place. A pot full of gold, saved especially for a day like this. He finds her amazing, as this is no small amount of money, but although he appreciates it deeply, this much won't do. Iris wonders what he's talking about, and that's when he says he wants to join the Imperial School, Philian Academy. She screams in shock, which can be heard even outside. The Philian Academy is the Empire's best educational institution. It hold the continent's most outstanding teachers, and combined with the Imperial family's generous funding, this place is sure to give anyone who goes there the finest education. It's prestigious enough to be called a factory of heroes, as many have come from it. Adishan, the great commander, Swordmaster Shulifan, and the worst criminal, the Winter Witch. The guys from Philion were quite useful during the war, so he understands why Adishan mentioned it to him. However, being so famous is also an issue, as its fees and entrance standards are quite heavy. He also didn't expect that reaction from his sister, but he will show her the results. He goes to the meeting spot he established with Asel, who came only because he said that he won't let her go if she didn't come. Ronan notes that they will be busy tonight, as there's something he wants to test her on. It's nothing much though, all she needs to do is lift him as high as she can. She's surprised he requested this, as it's quite dangerous. Ronan tells her that it's not all that, so the only thing she needs to do is listen to him. He will not die from it, so she shouldn't be scared. She begins using her telekinesis, and rises Ronan high in the air, who thinks that this is much better than he initially expected. Although its stability and height is lacking, this feeling is quite familiar, as during the battle with a Hayut, what allowed him to fight equally with that giant freak was telekinesis. It's a rare ability, even among mages, so that means she's going to become the most important thing needed for his battle against him. This start is quite lucky to begin with. A cell notes that it's becoming difficult to hold him, and he urges her to hold a little while longer, as he has something to check. He will be coming down himself, and with those words, he cuts Acel's mana, and lands perfectly. She's shocked he just did that, and asks what he did exactly. Ronan shrugs it off as it being nothing, only some acrobatic movement he's been able to do for a while. That's not what she was asking about though, but Ronan urges her to keep her mouth shut, as he also doesn't know much about it. However, this might be the reason his sword worked on that guy in the first place. He can take things slowly however, as there's something that needs to be done. He hands Acel a bag, and says that she needs to follow him, as before the moon disappears, there's something they need to do. This adventure might become the first page of Ronan's biography, the Empire's greatest history, and in general book. Ronan tells her where they are going, and she's quite unsure about their destination. He asks if she doesn't want to, but that isn't the issue. He has talent and a knack for martial arts, but she doesn't know anything. Plus, she's quite cowardly and timid. Ronan, in turn, asks if she really wants to live like that, wasting her innate talent on humoring punks. Is that truly the way she wants to live? And yes, she does have idiotic sides too. She's cowardly and timid, easily becomes a crybaby from just about anything, and also a plain loser. But all of this is fine, as she can change from now on. She shouldn't dally around too much, as the time that passes now cannot be taken back, and one day, she will come to regret it, like he did in his past life. He hopes that changed her mind, but she finds this as him worrying about her which she's quite glad for. Ronan notes that he won't force her into anything, and turns his back away, but she says that she will come with, as she wants to change as well. She will go to the academy with him, so he only needs to show her what's needed. Ronan smiles, and notes that this is the first time she's acting this way, so they should start her next objective. He smiles sinisterly, as everything is going just as he planned it to. They come up to something, and she's quite shocked at her first objective. Her opponent, who can bring out her true skills, is a lunar goblin, and the leader of a pack at that. Isn't it great? But they shouldn't waste any more time and get started already. The Lunar Goblin is a type of creature that appears around this area quite frequently, and they can be differentiated from other normal goblins by their yellow skin and disfigured bodies. But the thing about these types of goblins is that they go absolutely crazy over gold and other valuables. Due to this, they often ambush merchants to steal such treasurers. And when they gather enough, they put all of their stolen goods in one area and hold a festival. On a night with a full moon particularly, just like today, Acel fears the worst, and Ronan confirms her suspicions. This night, they are going to steal of their valued treasure. She says that she's never heard a whisper about the goblins holding a festival revolving around treasure like this. So how did he know? He notes that he has his ways of knowing things, as he can't just tell her he saw them in his past life. He would sound crazy. But that doesn't matter now, 
as all she needs to do is use her telekinesis ability and move all of the treasure into their bag, as the goblins are dozing off right now. Simple, right? Acel says that it doesn't sound easy at all, and if something goes wrong and they wake up, what will they do then? Ronan doesn't lie, and notes that if that were to happen, things wouldn't be pretty at all. She urges him to rethink this plan if that is the case, but he thinks that she's too much of a coward. They aren't doing this because they can, as they need two things in order to get into Filion. First and foremost, they need money, so that they can afford that insane tuition fee. Secondly, real experience, as this is much more important than money. As she probably knew already, Filion is filled with aristocrats who have received the most elite training possible from birth. If she wants to win against people like them, there is only one real way, gain experience by risking their lives. Those goblins seem like the perfect opponents as they gain cash, but also some experience. Two birds with one stone, as they say. Does she perhaps have a better and more grandiose idea? She confirms that she in fact does not, and Ronan notes that they should start right now. Little by little, the treasure and valuables are slowly being dragged into their bags. A cell is concentrating very hard, and Ronan instructs her calmly. Eventually, the last bag gets filled up, and he congratulates a cell for doing a good job while also gaining some experience. Wasn't it easy? A cell says that they indeed managed to do it, and he thinks that he wasn't that confident in her abilities, but she adapted quite quickly. She's much better at this than he originally thought. He has found a real nice minion to do his bidding. Ronan says that with these bags filled up, they should get going. As there isn't anything left for them here, they should head back before anything goes wrong. That's when two men who are chasing a bird start screaming through the forest for it, which wakes up the goblins, who become extremely mad goblins, as their precious treasure has disappeared. They all get up and search for the thieves, but it doesn't take long to find them, as Ronan and Acel didn't manage to get out of the area in time. All of them charge the thieves, and Acel is ready to pass away from how scared she is. She falls to her knees, and Ronan notes that he knew things were going too well for this situation. Acel suggests they throw the bags at them and run away, but Ronan is having none of it. How does she expect to pay that tuition without this? Earn it? She tries to say that this is not the important thing right now, but she doesn't get to finish, as the goblins are extremely close. Ronan analyzes the sword, and notices that it's made quite cheaply, so it should withstand about 15 attacks at least. However, there are 30 of them. One jumps to him, and he's still thinking. 15 attacks? That's plenty. He cuts off the heads of three with one single strike. Now he only has 14 attacks left. Birds scream throughout the forest, while Ronan takes care of the last goblin. Acel can only stare in shock, as she can't hope to explain what she just saw. He decapitated three with a single strike, and for the horde rushing afterwards, he disappeared, and appeared again in half a second. He is extremely powerful, but to think he would create such a spectacle. He asks her to stop spacing around so much, and she apologizes. Ronan notes that she has nothing to feel sorry about, as they need to get their stuff and leave. They are going home. While doing that, they find the bags quite uncomfortable, as they are pretty heavy, given the loot inside of them. Ronan notices that his muscles are sore from that scuffle with the goblins. Is it perhaps because he's still growing? When they go back, he needs to do some rigorous physical training. Acel wonders if he might know what that loud shout was that tipped them off to the goblins. He notes that it's uncertain, but it was definitely someone crazy as you would have to be as such to scream in this forest. Someone draws his bow behind them and shoots an arrow directly at a cell. Ronan catches it and she realizes what happened, but where could it have come from? Ronan wonders if this godforsaken forest is cursed or are they just plain unlucky? He asks the people who shot the arrow who they are and they notice that these are kids, not goblins. They apologize, but it's clear that their intentions aren't as pure as they would like to present as their eyes are on the treasure in their bags. Ronan notices their suspicious attitude and their predatory eyes, so they should stop talking nonsense and answer him properly. Who are they? They are both surprised by his reaction, and the short-haired one apologizes for not introducing themselves while coming closer to him. He pulls out a knife and claims that they are Caliboro. Ronan keeps calm and grabs his hand swiftly. He manages to knock his attacker out in one strike, and he seems to know that name from somewhere. The other charges in and Acel musters up the courage to use her powers to stop him and tell Ronan that there's another behind him. He congratulates her for doing this and kicks the knife out of the attacker's hand. He catches it, and in not even a second, he slashes him everywhere. The attacker and his body took a while to process what happened, but there's no saving for him as he dies in an explosion of blood. Acel cowers away 
and asks if that guy really is dead. He confirms it, as he won't let anyone who tried to kill him live. It's only fair, right? And didn't she hear? These guys are Caliboro. She asks what they are and he's happy to explain. They partake in poaching, kidnappings, and human trafficking. This group does every crime under the sun, and thus, they have gained the reputation of the Empire's most evil poaching group. So, if he wasn't here, her organs would have been harvested and buried somewhere. Knowing who these people are and letting them live is a crime in it of itself. She needs to understand that. The bag that they had with them suddenly starts moving around, and Ronan wonders what can be inside of it. A cell thinks that it's most likely a poached animal, but to confirm they open the bag up. Blue eyes beam out of the bag, and a blue bird comes out. They are both quite surprised, and Ronan wonders what this chicken is. It watches them from above, and a cell finds it quite pretty, as it's her first time seeing a blue bird like this one. He notes that he also hasn't seen one before, and spots that it's shackled with Caliboro's trap. This special shackle disturbs the prisoner's mana, and restricts their movements quite a bit. He thought that these guys use these things as a last resort, or when catching mighty creatures. Is this tiny bluebird one? A rune pops up behind it, and it strangely starts speaking, spooking a cell. Ronan calms her down, as this is only communication magic. However, it was able to talk with them as soon as it came out of the bag. So, is the bag able to block mana, perhaps? Ronan speaks, and says that he's most likely the owner of this bird, right? The person says that he's right, and his name is Varen, and is currently researching fantastical beasts at the institution. He is that bird who goes by the name of Maprez, Guardian. He tried countless times to communicate, but it didn't seem to work. So he was thinking of actually making a report, but he's quite relieved he didn't have to. He also apologizes for being rude and asks for their identities. Ronan says that they are just passerby with a good heart, as they got into the poachers who captured the bird, but he can't really explain what happened, as too much blood was spilled to do it properly. He just says that they saved the bird without the additional information, and the person behind the rune is extremely surprised. It crossed his mind that poachers were the cause of this, but anyways, they are indebted to him right now. Ronan notes that such things aren't needed, but how do they return the bird to him, as it seems quite exhausted from being chained up? If he were to take the chain off, could it fly back to him? The owner confirms this, as the bird has a great homing instinct, so he should be able to free it. Ronan cuts the chain which breaks instantly, and urges the bird to go back to its father, as he's making him worry. The bird is extremely grateful and starts cheeping around. Ronan notes that the bird is currently shoving its ass into his face and dancing around. So what does this mean? The owner notes that it just wants him to pluck out a feather before it flies away, as it wants to meet with them again someday. After plucking out a dream bird's feather, it will direct to the main body constantly, like a compass of sorts. With that, he says that if he comes by the institution someday, they should come and visit them, as he will definitely repay them. The bird flies away, and a cell asks Ronan what he's holding. When he looks at his hand, he's also quite surprised. A few days later, a merchant assesses the valuables they have obtained, and notes that he will give them 20 gold coins for this certain piece. This man is the owner of the Carabel Merchantry, Duan Carabel. He notes that all of the items he brought today are quite valuable, so it must be his lucky day. Ronan says that he's quite glad he has finally found someone who understands, as all of the merchants he tried up until now tried to scam him, which pissed him off quite a bit. But to think such a confident and worthy merchant was around here, walking around really paid off. Duan notes that he's honored by his words, and asks if there are any more things he would like to sell. Ronan pulls out an egg from his pocket, and says that he's curious as to what this thing is, but won't sell it. That night, the blue dream bird left this very egg behind. Initially, he thought it took a crap in his hands, but it didn't. However, this didn't stop him from throwing the item into a boulder before looking. Surprisingly, the boulder broke first, so it seems that this is quite the valuable item. He doesn't know if it's that bird's egg specifically, but it's certainly a product made by a fantastical creature, so it might be worth quite a lot. The merchant analyzes it diligently, and notes that this color and texture can be only one thing. Ronan is now anticipating some very good news, but his dreams are shattered, as Duan says that it resembles horse crap. He doesn't know what it is, as it's quite the unusual object, so why doesn't he get it appraised in a place made for that? Ronan sighs and says that he will, but he can't sell it now, as he's quite curious about it. He also asks if he has any books about Filion, as they are planning to do the entrance exam together, but they don't know much about it. Duan notes that this is perfect timing, as his daughter is also doing the Filian exam so he's sure she will be of some help to them. She eventually comes around and asks who these people are. Duan presents her to them, his only child Maria, 
Ronan looks at her and seems to recognize her from somewhere. Duan urges her to say hello, as these are some customers he made a big deal with. Maria asks what these babies sold him, and Duan demands she be more polite. He also apologizes to them for her rough language, as she grew up in the merchantry. A cell notes that it's fine, and Ronan walks up to Maria, asking if it's really her. The same one that uses Sen as her middle name? She confirms this, but how does he know? Ronan notices that she indeed looks like that person, but something is quite strange. He urges her to come closer, as he has a question for her. Does she perhaps have that under there? A Johnson, that is. Maria wonders what garbage she just listened to. A Johnson? Ronan says that no matter how he looks at it, her having one seems out of the question. Does that merchant have a lost son or something? She slaps the snot out of him and demands he shut his mouth already. This slap causes Ronan to have a revelation. This good slap. This familiar sensation. She really is that person. Count Maria Sen. When he was a disciplinary soldier in a place that went by the name of Armarlen, Maria was in charge of the supplies. She held a great work ethic and also had an easygoing personality, which allowed her to get along with anyone. She was quite the impressive person. When talks about Johnson's occurred among the guys, Maria got unusually angry and had a habit of slapping people around. He always wanted to ask when they met again, but he never got the chance to as she died before he did. To think he would find the answer to his burning question here? She was a girl, all this time? She sees him laughing and thinks that he didn't have enough. So she charges in for another attack. Ronan hits her in the head and says that she's acting up after slapping him. He only let her because he was in the wrong. This causes her to get mad. So she headbutts him in the chin. They continue to fight like animals, with a cell and Duan watching in horror. Eventually, they have to intervene. A while later, a cell is surprised at this turn of events, as these two just fought like they wanted to kill each other. But now, they are seemingly getting along. They assess the things they just bought, three swords and a magic wand. Maria asks why he bought so many swords, as she imagines it would be quite troublesome to carry this many. Ronan notes that they are just reserves, as he uses a sword quite roughly. She asks what he thinks about the quality, and he says that they aren't bad at all, but the best one is this one, which is made with black iron. Maria agrees, as black iron is quite sturdy, so it's an item even renowned knights often seek out. She doesn't know how roughly he treats his sword, but this most likely won't break. Ronan thinks that this was one of his favorite weapons in the past. Maria explains that this wand has a good magic stone inside of it, so is it perhaps for this cute little mage? A cell confirms it and notes that she uses telekinesis magic. Maria finds this amazing and notes that she will surely get a scholarship with that type of magic. This only leaves them two, so what technique will he show during the practical exam? Ronan asks what she's talking about, and she explains that in order to enter Filion, everyone must take a practical where one will need to impress the professors and show them techniques. They also have a theory exam, which is quite difficult, but not as difficult as the practical. To the point that it's said, if you pass that, you won't need the theory exam at all. Basically, he just needs to prove his worth, or forget about the academy. Ronan notes that a swordsman like himself just needs to show good swordsmanship. But what do people usually demonstrate? Maria says that nobles usually show their family's secret techniques, but most martial artists and applicants alike demonstrate their personal techniques. Ronan stop her for a second, and asks if kids who use swords can use mana at this age, even though they aren't mages. Maria finds his question quite weird, as being able to do that as a prospective Philian student is a given. One would constantly sense their mana anyways, so why not use it in combat? Ronan doesn't get it all all, but Maria does. He doesn't know how to sense mana, right? Ronan asks if it's not similar to using aura, and Maria is shocked she's talking to this guy about entering Philian. How can he say mana and aura are similar? He notes that it's probably something he knew about already, so why is she making such a fuss? She demands he come outside now, and that she needs to borrow the swords for something. He asks if she will pay for them if something were to happen, and she explains that it won't take that long. But if that happens, she will pay the price threefold. So, how about it? Now they should stop the chit-chat and get to some special training. Mana is the source of the power of nature, and like air, it's natural and exists everywhere in the world. However, that doesn't mean that everyone can use it, as in order to, one needs to see and feel his own mana and be able to use their mana sense. To enter this stage, one can use training, innate talent, or other things, with various personal reason also coming into play. But it usually takes one year of training to even start sensing mana. Philian's prospective students surpass that stage early, and after learning their own mana techniques, they apply to Philion. Does he get it now? He doesn't have sense, 
and can't even tell the difference between Mana and Aura, so for him to go to Filion is just plain crazy. But it is true that Aura is also a type of Mana, but difference between them is extremely large. Ronan asks if it's really that big, and Maria explains that even those who have showed talent and trained for a minimum of 10 years find it hard to obtain their enlightened innate power, that is Aura. Ronan says that he understands a bit, and thinks that he met a few people on the battlefield from time to time, who bragged constantly about being Aura users, and used quite an unusual power. They were definitely annoying to deal with, but he's not surprised to find out they had an amazing ability, although one still dies if they get sliced enough. Maria says that they should stop with the explanations and get started already. He will probably learn faster by using his body, rather than his head anyways. Ronan thinks that she's a young girl, so she can't hope to do much. But she closes the gap instantly, which takes him by surprise. Their swords clash, and Ronan spots that she's ready for battle. They continue to fight, and Ronan is surprised she's exerting this much power at such a young age, and also dual wielding. He can't see it, so he's not really sure. But is her fighting style perhaps related to mana? Maria is also surprised, as she planned to finish him in one go, and make him give up on the test, because it thought this would be better than facing complete humiliation in the testing area. However, she's the one getting pushed back. Is this really the skill of someone who can't use mana? Ronan asks what she's thinking about. This takes her by surprise, allowing him to deflect her blades and charge a mighty attack. He warns her, she should dodge this one. She barely manages to do so, and notes that if she hesitated even for a second, she would have been gone. He's not normal, isn't he? Ronan says that the same could be said of her as she's quite talented with a sword. She's only a little rusty with maintaining her center of gravity, but if she fixed that, she would improve quite a bit. He starts leaving, and she demands that he stop, as the fight isn't over yet. He urges her to keep her word about paying threefold, and that's when one of her swords shatters into pieces, right before her eyes. Ronan tells her get the money ready, and Asel taps her own the shoulder, as she wanted to congratulate her. With that, they leave, leaving Maria to wonder just who these people are. The next day, they go to the market to get their money, but Maria has also gifted them some books, which contain information about the Filion Theory exam. She's sure they need them, as the exam is taking place next month. Ronan notes that they indeed need them, but why would she go this far? Is she perhaps trying to mess with them? Maria calms him down and says that it's nothing of the sort. She's just taken a liking to them is all. It's a simple service because Shu wants all of them to pass for free, no additional fees needed. She would have liked to teach him personally, but because of their deals, they need to head out, so they should study hard. As if they fail even after this, she will be mad. With that, she leaves, and Ronan thinks that he needs to train his body and also study, which he has no knack for. But this is certainly not a bad feeling. Ronan's life after returning back home was similar to how it usually was, but it started to change slightly. He ate together with Iris like usual, but he did so to the point where his stomach would burst. Filled with that many calories, he hunted beasts on the outskirts of the village, and started to increase his stamina and adaptability like that. He did it to the point where there were no more beasts left around the village. Besides that, he also studied, which was unimaginable for a disciplinary soldier like himself. But despite that, he tried his best, and after a month, their main story is about to begin, in Valon, the capital city. At its center stood the best education institution in the whole empire, the White Tower's own small city. Acel admires Filion and how masterfully crafted it is, but Ronan urges her to not stand in the middle of the street like the bumpkin she is, and move, as they will be late for the exam. She replies in a strange way, as she still finds it quite surprising that he grew so much in just one month. Ronan urges her to stop thinking about useless things and get going. He thinks that since they are here, they might meet him. The Sword Saint Schlieffen, a descendant of Grancia, a prestigious swordsman family. He is a genius who is considered the strongest in the entire empire. He should be around they age, so he might be taking the exam now, but it doesn't really matter. Acel asks if he has that thing, the feather the dream bird gave them, that was supposed to lead them to its owner. He notes that he did indeed pack it before they left, and he was also planning to visit after the test. That's when they notice that the feather is pointing to the highest floor of Filion. Inside, the bird's owner notes that he isn't really used to being a professor, but the bird is cheering him on which he appreciates, but he should keep going, to repay the kind hero who save him. This is Filian's zoology professor, Varen Fanashir, a were lion. He thinks that he should open the window for some ventilation, as they need to present himself nicely to their hero, right? When he opens the window, however, he sees Ronan, 
who looks like he's here for other things. He spots the bird from before, but him and his owner both scream, as this has taken them by surprise quite a bit. Varen backs himself from them, and asks who they are, and how they even managed to get up so high, as this is one of the top floors. Ronan notes that he screams way too loud, and Asel says that this is why they should have taken the stairs. Varen asks if they are after his precious comrade, Marpez, but that's when he notices what Ronan is holding, the feather. He finally realizes that they are the heroes who saved Marpez. They sit down, and Varen apologizes for his unsightly behavior, especially in front of their heroes. Ronan says that it's nothing, so he doesn't need to repeat himself so much. But if they would go into specifics, a cell would be more at fault, since used telekinesis to climb to the window. She denies this, as he was the one who told her to do that. However, her opinion seems to be invalid, as Ronan just shuts her up. More importantly, he certainly didn't imagine for a were lion to be the owner of the bird, and also a professor at Filion. Varen notes that he was also quite surprised, and would have written a letter of recommendation for them if he knew they were entrance applicants. Ronan notes that it's fine, and since they are here, he has something important to ask. Specifically what this is, as that bluebird just left it behind like it was too heavy or something. Varen looks a bit closer, and confirms that indeed, this is a dream bird egg. He's quite shocked that Marpez really laid an egg, but Ronan doesn't understand him, as birds lay eggs quite often. Varen explains that it's not just a simple bird, but a dream bird, and that he has absolutely no idea about what's going to hatch from this egg. Ronan again is puzzled, and says that if it's a bird egg, a bird will hatch, right? Varen notes that a dream bird is quite different, as depending on the environment surround it, a dream bird will absorb unique mana and lay an egg. In an area of lava, a mighty phoenix might hatch, or in a monster's nest, the hatched dream egg will take the appearance of a monster, and so on. There are many circumstances where it won't take the form of a normal bird at all. If he analyzes the mana that's coming from the egg, it's possible to predict what appearance the dream bird might have. However, this certain egg holds a myriad of mana, and it's going rampant. As of right now, it's hard to say for certain what this egg contains. Ronan notes that he really likes to put meaning into mere things like eggs. But where has this bird been wandering to lay an egg such as this? Marpez chirps, and Ronan finds his attitude quite shameless. Varen asks if they will take care of the egg, and Ronan notes that they will, but isn't it a precious item? Varen confirms that indeed it is, as a dream bird lays a single egg in its lifetime, but it laid it in front of its heroes, so Marpez must have felt something special with them. He just wants to respect his friend's choices, that's all. Ronan says that he's fine with it, as he's quite curious as to what will come out of the egg as well. However, it's almost time for the exam, so they should be going now. Varen stops them for a second, as he wanted to give something to them, that will certainly help with the hatching of the egg. A while later, at the practical testing hall, Galean Castle's main building, every participant sits in the waiting room. Some check their weapons, while others pray. A man announces that applicant 111 exam has ended, so applicant 112 should come forth. He does so, and Ronan thinks that if this guy is number 112, he's up next, but they really like to make they wait a long time. Doesn't she think so as well? Maria says that every exam is like this, and Ronan asks why she's wearing that, as it seems very uncomfortable. She notes that Filian is a private academy which nobles attend, who might become expensive customers in the future, so she should look the part, right? Ronan thinks that she's just doing too much at this point, and she notes that it would have been nice if a cell was here too. Ronan explains that nothing can be done about that, since the magic testing hall is somewhere else entirely. However, he will be quite glad if he doesn't see her crying by herself when she gets back. Applicant 112 gets out of the exam chamber with quite the tired face, and so, it seems to be Ronan's turn. Maria urges him to not be nervous and try his best, as if he fails, she will chase him down to the ends of the earth. Ronan thanks her for the ever so touching words and support, and notes that he will be back. He enters the chamber, and comes in front of the Philian professors, who look extraordinarily powerful. Among them, that old man in the middle stands out, as he's the headmaster, Archmage Krava Kratir. The woman next to him also has an overwhelming aura, and he's rarely felt this type of vigor from someone, even in his past life. This is the swordsmanship instructor, the Grand Sword Saint, Nabaros. He presents himself, and Krava does the same. He explains that he will be up against a magically engineered dummy, and he needs to demonstrate a technique. So what has he decided to show them today? Ronan looks at it and thinks that a fast cut might do the trick on this dummy. The man next to Krava notes that there's always someone who underestimates the dummy just because of how it looks, and says foolish things. The man next to him concurs, but if this applicant is from the country of course, 
he wouldn't know. Even if it does look the way it does, it has fast regeneration, and it's a product of magical engineering. He whispers that even the genius Schlieffen barely managed to leave a scratch on his own sword, so he really wonders what he will be doing differently. The other jokes that he might actually split it in half, and they laugh quite loudly. Krava wonders if that child will prove them wrong, and when he looks at him, he's surprised that he holds such vigor, especially at such a young age. Ronan breaks the ground with his movement, and in a single slash, impresses Nabarose a lot. He sheathes his sword, and says that this is all he had to present. The two gossiping professors note that they expected this much, but when they look at Krava, his jaw is dropped to the floor. Nabarose puts her foot on the table and launches herself towards Ronan, with killing intent and sword ready. The sword almost reaches his neck until it stops, and she demands to know where he learned that swordsmanship from. He asks what she might mean with this, and she changes the question. Did he perhaps see her movements? Ronan says that he did, as in that instant she jumped at him. She unsheathed the sword and swung three times. Nabarroz says that he's correct, and it's just like what he showed them with that arrogant cut. Did he really think she wouldn't notice? That foolish swordsmanship of his? He slowed down his last cut intentionally, just in case they didn't see it, like he was being considerate of them or something. He's quite arrogant for his age, but has he really forgotten where he is? Krava looks at this, and the theory professors, who now feel a bit guilty, wonder what to do. Ronan thinks that this is just a simple misunderstanding, as he only adjusted the strength because he thought the sword wouldn't be able to withstand the last cut. But judging by the current mood, it seems like she wouldn't believe him now. Nabarose sheathes her sword and says that she will remember him, and will definitely be the one to teach him. Krava looks at her and thinks that she basically called dibs on this to be her disciple already. It seems that he needs to pay more attention to the trainees from now on. He congratulates Ronan for a job well done, and notes that now they will end the test with a common question. It doesn't have a real answer, so he can answer with what he feels like. What does he want to learn from coming to Filion? Ronan ponders the question a bit, and he answers with, to not have any regrets. That is what he wants to learn first and foremost. Krava says that he can leave, and he does so. To not have any regrets, huh? He wonders how he will be able to teach him something like that. And one of the theory professors asks what's going on, as he and Nabarose are acting quite strange. What did that boy really do? Perhaps a trick. Krava notes that it might be a good way to put it, or rather, pure talent is a better way to explain. The head of the magic dummy falls off, and the cut is extremely clean. Ronan thinks about the lady who threatened his life just now, and wonders if he would have been able to win, even in his past life. He thought he went through way too many hardships for anything to surprise him anymore, but this is something very different. He thinks that he did good coming to Filion, as he feels he will be able to learn quite a bit. Now, only the written test is left, but it will be quite easy, as he memorized lots of things. However, after finishing, he's very down, and says that he's done for. Maria asks why he couldn't answer half of the test. Did he perhaps not look at the books in his bag? Acel explains that he took the things he needed to study and moved his bag, but after hyper-focusing, he forgot about the bag completely. Maria thinks that he's a real fool and asks if the announcement will come soon. She picks him up and notes that it's fine, as the practical matters more, and with his skills, he must have passed. The tower suddenly starts glowing from the bottom, and the list of people who passed pops up. They go to check quickly, and surely enough, both Acel and Maria are on there, with Acel being tied first in the theory test. They are extremely happy that they managed to pass, and Maria congratulates her for being basically the first, which is quite an amazing achievement. She turns around to Ronan, but he's basically dead inside, as he did not pop up anywhere on the list. Maria urges him to look closer with those tiny eyes of his, but he says that his name isn't anywhere on the list, as he messed up royally. Suddenly, a large ball of fire drops down next to them, and Maria explains that this is the entrance exam's last cannon fire for each department's salutatorian a glory phoenix. It sends a few fireballs, and one heads straight for Ronan. It causes a pretty large explosion, but after the smoke clears, Ronan sees that he's been invited to the martial arts department's salutatorian, as he got first place in the practical, and we won't talk about his theory placement. The girls hug him tightly, and Maria notes that for someone who flunked the theory exam, he must have done something amazing to enter the martial arts salutatorian. Ronan thinks that if he got first place, that guy lost to him, and with his personality, there's no way he's just going to stay quiet. Sure enough, he comes from behind, and notes that he must be the one who came first in the practical test. This is the sword saint, Schlieffen. Other people are surprised that the Empire's shining star would be here, with Maria and Acel also being quite shocked because of his presence. Ronan thinks that if he's the same as he was in his past life, things will become troublesome, 
as that guy just can't stand anyone who is better at the sword than him. He has an outrageous fighting spirit. He must avoid this situation at all costs, so he tries to play dumb, but Schlieffen sees through him instantly and starts unsheathing his sword. He tries to strike Ronin, who manages to block him. Schlieffen notes that if he wasn't the first, he would have not been able to block that attack. People gather to watch the fight, and he notes that he wants to see the skills that bested him. Ronin has had enough, and notes that if this is really what he wants, he will be glad to show him. He strikes three times, and Schlieffen defects all of them. Ronin asks if this is enough for him, and sure enough, his hand starts to tremble from the force. Now, it makes sense he got a good score, as he has shown great technique, but this is nowhere near enough to beat him. Ronin urges him to relax already, but Schlieffen is too in his head to even comprehend words, as he still can't accept that this guy got first place. Ronin thinks that this bastard is plain crazy, and this is exactly why he didn't want to meet him. At this point, he will start manipulating Aura, which will be very bad. As he can't handle his Aura called the Tempest Sword, he's sure that he can't. However, he has a plan, so he starts running, and Schlieffen asks how he dares turn his back to an opponent like this. Ronin grabs a cell and puts her in front of him. Schlieffen is extremely angry that he's using a lady as a meat shield. Can he really call himself a knight? A cell notes that he's a guy. At this point I think that the author is also quite confused about his gender, so we will leave it like that. Ronan uses this opportunity to hit Schlieffen square in the face and bolts it out of there with his party. One of the teachers comes to see what's going on and spots that Schlieffen is injured. He says that he will call the guards and go after those rascals, but Schlieffen urges him to speak informally, as he's not the son of an important family right now, but just an applicant with a commoner status. And he also doesn't need to worry about this, as it was a simple fair fight. That's when he notices that his sword cracked, a sword made with the highest grade mithril. He thought that Ronan's skill wasn't that great, but to think he would do this much with such a common sword, he will certainly remember his name. The next day, at the outskirts of the capital, in a forest called Shimo, Ronan and Asel walk around, with Ronan following a map. Asel asks if they can really afford to do this right now, as yesterday, he broke the nose of the heir of the Grancia Ducal family. What will he do if he decided to retaliate, huh? Ronan notes that he shouldn't worry, as he's a good guy, just crazy about the way of the sword. He's someone who upholds principle and trust above all else, everyone's role model, one who protects the weak, basically the epitome of the perfect noble. He probably said that what happened was a simple spar, as if he hadn't they would have been behind bars already. Acel notes that he's right, and they arrive at the mana vein Varen told them about, the Fernardo Spring. Mana that hovers around the world for an unknown reason and gathers in a single spot is called a mana vein. With its existence, mana would be absorbed by its surrounding matter. A regular plain rock would turn into the highest grade mana stone, and a random weed from the ground would transform into a rare medicinal herb. It is quite famous, and it possesses great attributes. Its value is very large, and people would monopolize it in an instant if they saw it. So the Varen is quite generous to give something like this to them, only to hatch an egg. He asks a cell if it fells any different around here, and he notes that it's his first time sensing so much mana in one place. If it's around here, he can use magic that is stronger than usual. That egg in his pocket is also doing something, as it's absorbing mana at incredible speeds. Ronan notes that they will see, but it would have been nice to also have Maria here, but she couldn't come because she was busy with the merchantry. A cell notices that something is strange, as Varen said that since there's a lot of mana here, a few fantastical species nest and relax in this place. Even for regular animals, this place is a gold mine, but they haven't heard a single animal since they came here. Ronan takes a whiff of the air and thinks that he was too complacent. He laments that things are getting out of hand again, and he urges a cell to get ready as he has caught the scent of blood. The hunters who wear fox skulls start assaulting them with arrows, but Ronan destroys all of them with a single strike. However, he seems to remember the arrowheads these arrows use. In the past, at a campsite, one of the people from his group explained that this arrowhead could even blow up an orc head, and that they were used by an elite member of a certain organization, Caliboro. Ronan is surprised that he ran into them once again, and thinks that only the bloodhounds have access to arrowheads like this, so it must be a team full of them. He tells a cell to go hide, if he doesn't want to become a porcupine, that is. As for himself, he will have to do a bit of hunting. The leader of the Bloodhound group is surprised that this brat managed to cut arrows that had mana infused in them. Just who is this guy? He tells everyone to split, and Ronan thinks that he's taking decisions quite fast, which isn't good for him. He tells them to stop attacking, as he's an ally. 
The leader asks what nonsense he's talking about, and Ronan explains that he's the youngest bloodhound from the Damas branch, a Hayut. They all gather around him and immediately start interrogating him, as he's too young to be a bloodhound. Ronan tells him to ask the wolf from this branch, and also says that he shouldn't assume that people can't do what he does. This enrages him, and starts threatening violence. One of the subordinate calms him down, as even if he's still a hid, he knows about the Caliboro ranking system, which is kept very hidden, and only members know. They should wait for the captain to confirm his identity. That's when the captain arrives. A man by the name of Viam, and the leader of the small group explains the situation. Ronan smiles, as he's quite glad they are all gathered in one place. Vayam starts interrogating him and asks what he's doing here, as this mountain range belongs to Demir. Ronan says that he wasn't sure, as he's not really a high Ute. In that second he slashes, most of the men in two, and before Vayam can react, he cleanly cuts his head off. The only survivor is the team leader, and Ronan says that he told him already, his ending will be bad. The leader's fingers fall off, and he falls to his knees because of the pain. Ronan says that if he doesn't want to die like the rest, he will write down the locations of all the branches he knows of. Of course, if he's so loyal and doesn't want to, he will have to dispose of him. The leader asks how he can do that with one hand. But Ronan already gave him a pen, and his right hand looks just fine. Afterwards, Ronan congratulates him for drawing a detailed map, and the leader asks if he will let him go now. Ronan slashes him clean in half, as of course he couldn't have let him go. A cell starts throwing up at what he just saw, and Ronan urges him to stop overreacting and get a hold of himself. A cell apologizes, but this is a bit too much, as there are countless dead animals in here. Ronan told him before, letting people like these alive is a crime, so he should stop worrying about it. However, if Varen sees this, he will be quite saddened, as his bird is also among the victims. The egg suddenly starts shaking in its pouch, and a cell points at something while trembling. Ronan's eyes widen when he looks, as the blood from the animals starts to form into a ball. Ronan prepares to fight once again, and the egg escapes from its pouch. It starts glowing, and all of the blood starts circulating around it. It's absorbing the blood, and a cell asks what's going on. Ronan notes that he doesn't know, but one thing is for sure, whatever is inside of this egg is quite special. Eventually the egg finishes the blood, and shortly after, it starts cracking. Ronan patiently waits to see what's inside, but is greeted by a hit to the face by the dream bird, who doesn't seem to be a bird at all. A cell says that it resembles a dragon, as he saw similar things in books. Ronan wonders what that bird did to make an egg like this, but he admits that it is quite cute. However, the greeting was a little much, as a sucker punch to the face isn't the best feeling. The dream bird begins casting some magic, and it heals Ronan's injuries fully. A cell notes that it's capable of healing magic, and also seems to like him quite a bit. A cell says that they should name it, as they can't keep calling it a dream bird. Suddenly, it notices something, and bolts towards it. A Demire branch errand boy by the name of Balrus starts running away from the forest, as he saw the bodies Ronan left behind, and also what happened with the egg. That's when he notices that the dream bird is towards him, and in that moment of carelessness, he trips, causing him to fall. The dream bird starts draining his blood through his knee, which looks very painful, but Ronan comes and tells it to stop, as it will kill him if this continues. He also gives it the name of Sita, which it seems to like. Balrus wonders if this guy is the owner of this beast, and Ronan asks if he's alright, calling him by his name. Balrus notes that he is, and thanks him for saving his life. But how does he know his name? Ronan pulls his sword out, and notes that he doesn't need to know that. He didn't think they would meet like this, but it's nice that they finally do. This was a dear comrade to him in the past, who is now just a mere errand boy, which amuses Ronan quite a bit. But getting to the point, he needs him to do something, and for his information, he can't say no. Later that day, Ronan plays around with some cash he made through selling some of the water from the mana vein to Maria's father, who gave them quite a large amount of money for it. Ronan notes that they are indebted to Varen now, and they did want to thank him, but he went on a business trip suddenly which is quite unfortunate. However, in addition to the job he assigned Balrus, the map he received from that bloodhound is quite useful. He also instilled so much fear in Balrus that he wouldn't think of betraying him. A cell asks if he wants to buy something with the money, and Ronan thinks that the entrance ceremony will be taking place soon, so it seems that he does have something. A few days later, Iris arrives in the city, which she likes quite a bit. Ronan greets her, noting that she must be quite tired from the trip, and also asks if something happened while he was gone. Iris notes that she should be the one to ask that, as she was quite surprised when a high-class carriage popped up in front of their house suddenly. And also, why has he lost so much weight? Is he perhaps not eating properly? Ronan notes that he's eating well enough, 
and Iris spots Sita, who salutes her. Ronan notes that they are just traveling together because of a few circumstances, but more importantly, they need to hurry, as he's going to be busy with the academy once he enters, but would like to do something beforehand. At a clothes shop, Iris says that she understands that he's got money, and is carefree because he also got a scholarship, but isn't it a bit too much? He talks with the store manager, and Iris continues, as these are way too many gifts. Ronan says that it's not that much, and it's about time she would benefit from all the hard work she did to raise him. This statement touches Iris's heart, and she screams that she has the kindest brother in the world. They finish shopping, and Ronan says that they will go to a few workshops, as he needs to repair his sword thanks to a certain someone. That certain someone pops up suddenly, which shocks Ronan and Sita a lot. Ronan asks what he's doing here, and Schlieffen says that he came to order a new sword, and that's when he spotted him. So he decided to wait until he came out, so he should stop misunderstanding things so easily. Ronan pulls out his sword, and notes that because of him his sword is in a poor state. Does he really want to for another round? Schlieffen notes that it's not a bad idea at all, but Iris gets in front of them, and demands that Ronan stops using such foul language. He tries to talk back, but she doesn't let him, and she turns to Schlieffen to apologize. In that moment, the most influential young man, and the Empire's shining star, fell into the trap of simping, as he fell in love at first sight. She continues to apologize, but while blushing, he says that it's because of his lack of tackiness, so a lady such as herself shouldn't take the responsibility. She grabs his hands, and notes that she's quite glad Ronan has a friend like him. Ronan just stares, as he's quite stupefied because of the situation. Schlieffen notes that he will compensate for the broken sword, and while he doesn't have any gold, they can have this, his family's proof of identification. Runin is quite shocked that he would just give out something like this, and Schlieffen explains that if they are going to get a sword, they should go to the blacksmith on the western end, as that place has hundreds of years of history, and they will surely be able to enter if they give them that. With that, he leaves, and Ronan is still shocked. With that proof of identification, one could buy most villages. Is this simp really the sword saint he once knew? The next day, at the entrance ceremony, Krava welcomes the freshmen of class 787 to the school. He talks about their limitless potential and the education they will receive here. But most of all, he congratulates them for their abilities. Ronan thinks that this is quite boring, but things like this aren't bad from time to time, as his sister seems to be liking it. Krava snaps his fingers, and a strange glow envelops the students. The students are all shocked, as the sky is seemingly shattering out of nowhere. With a large blue flash, they are all transported into an arena. Ronan wonders if Krava really teleported everyone with just a snap of his fingers, who notes that now since everyone is here, they should start the meeting between their seniors and juniors. The senior-junior meeting is something that occurs between the incoming freshmen of the school and the seniors who have been here for two years. Because this is the place where they meet each other for the very first time, the process is known and expected to be quite intense. It is also a, an event which the Philian school deems special. The way things are done are as so. The first and second ranks go to represent the freshmen, and they are each appointed to one of the four-year twos that are waiting for them, which all have their individual fighting styles, representative by the weapons they use. With all of this prepared, they will be part of a one-on-one -on -one spar. Krava starts speaking to everyone, and explains that this very significant event stands close to the hearts of the instructors of this school. It is not just about the professors, who eagerly wait to see what new pupils they can train and nurture, but also about the relationship between the seniors and juniors, as they learn from each other, for example, their weaknesses. He believes that from this exchange, they will be complementing each other, and competing like this is the start of their real, true education. These duels are only for educational purposes, and through them, the representatives of their respective years will be able to demonstrate how they take their first step into the real world. Naturally, because of this, the freshmen will be given the choice to choose who they fight, and it is possible to decline a duel. So they shouldn't feel burdened by this greeting, and feel free to do as they please. Ronan is kind of mad that this guy keeps beating around Bush, as this is basically just hazing the freshmen. From the right, the first guy is the martial arts major sophomore standing at rank 1, Nasdo. The second is in the same category, but stands at rank 2, Brahm, who is glad to see some hardy freshmen this time around. All of them seem to be in the same category, but with different ranks. The one on the left is called Karun, who is rank 4, while the red-haired woman on the right is named Irina, who is rank 3. 
Brahm starts screaming about how excited he is for the battles to start, and notes that he can't hold it in anymore. He wants to fight with all of his might. This creeps Ronan out a bit, and thinks that, with this situation, he can show his older sister that he is not going in this place just to get beat up. It would also be better if he could show her his great companionship with this guy that is standing next to him too, but that is still to be seen. Krava announces that they can now choose who to fight, and Ronan puts his hand up, as he has a suggestion he would like to make. Krava asks what that suggestion might be, and Ronan explains that, since they are able to choose who to fight freely, he would like to be taught by all of his most respectful seniors. This means, of course, that they will be coming for him all at once. The arena stands silent after hearing this, and the teachers begin discussing if something like this can be done. Krava asks Nabirose what her thoughts are on Ronan's suggestion, and she asks him to proceed with it, if he wishes to do so. Isn't this school's principle that if one possesses the skill, they are free to do whatever they wish? So, in this case, no matter who wins this duel, it will hold a deep meaning to a lot of people. If this goes south, like they usually tend to, she will also be intervening, if that helps his nerves calm down. Krava understands, and with this, allows what Ronan suggested to happen. All of the seniors are now serious, and stare at Ronan with anger. Karun thinks that all of this is quite absurd, just how badly is that boy looking down on them. Irina notes that he is doing whatever he wants, just because he was ranked second. They should use this opportunity to crush their spirits into powder. Nasdo urges them to calm down, as that child is arrogant, but Schlieffen is most definitely skilled, so he is an opponent that they can't just look down on. They will be going all out immediately, even if these are freshmen. Iris worryingly looks at Ronan and tells him to be careful, and if he thinks it is becoming too dangerous, he needs to forfeit right away. Ronan just waves at her, and with that all of the way, Krava announces that the first match between the juniors and seniors will now commence. Nasdo rushes in instantly, and tries to strike Ronan with all of his might, which makes Ronan think that they are quite sharp. It seems that they are only a couple levels higher than Maria, but it still means that they are basically on another level. Irina also charges in with her dagger, but Ronan blocks the attack and throws her hitting arm away. Karun comes from behind her and demands that she duck. She does so, and the spear almost reaches Ronan, but he blocks it, who is quite surprised by their level of teamwork. This attack pushes him back a bit, but that's when, in a moment of thinking, Brahm comes from behind him and gets ready to strike him with all of his might. Before he does that, he asks Ronan why he would be doing something like this, as he wanted to have a much more valiant spart with him. He tries to hit Ronan with the blade, who notices what they are all trying to do. A swift and strong finish blow, or distraction, while the others follow it up with an attack. Truly, they are all at a really high level, strategically at least. In that second, he jumps out of everyone's sight, and also hits them. They all begin falling down like swatted flies, but this proved to Ronan that they are all amazing, and this school that grew them into this must be even more so. He looks behind, and is quite surprised to see Brahm still standing, as he thought that his fighting spirit would have been shattered at this point. Well, he will remain considerate until that happens, so he should hold tight. They both charge in, but Brahm notices some extremely strange, as Ronan is now copying Nabarose's fighting style, or this is how it seems to him at least. Ronan smiles, and with three swift attacks, Brahm's sword shatters into small pieces, and Ronan thanks his seniors, as he has learned quite a lot from them. What happened here shocks the whole stadium, and they all shout with amazement and cheer for Ronan as he is extremely skilled, while the seniors look at their broken weapons. Nasdo begins laughing, as this fight was so one-sided, he can't hope to be upset about losing it. Where did this freshman even come from? One thing is for sure, at least his strength is plain monstrous. Ronan looks at his sister, who is almost choking a guy from the excitement, and thinks that with this, nobody would dare to try and bully him. Now, there is only one thing left to do. He makes his way to the seniors, and congratulates them for the amazing fight. He has learned quite a lot from this spar, and from them. He only placed himself in this situation because of he was very excited to be a student of Philion, but their strength is truly unimaginable. From the bottom of his very heart, he thanks them for accepting his challenge. He also pleads with them to pardon the rudeness that he displayed today, and looks forward to learn even further from them. He finishes all of this with a bow, and all of the seniors stare at each other in shock and awe. Suddenly, Brahm starts screaming that he was wrong about him, 
He is not only extremely strong, but also extremely polite. However, he needn't be so humble, as he fought fairly, and won just as so. He should be confident about his victory. He rises Rona's hand up and tells everyone that this is what an exemplary Philian student should be like. Brahm congratulates him on the amazing display of skills and manners, making Ronan say that he is quite the fiery man. With this, since he has shown his social skills so much, he is sure that his sister won't worry about that anymore. She begins crying about how he grew up so fast, while the guy next to her covers his chest, as she has ripped his shirt in half. A woman with purple hair watches this display and notes that this boy is quite interesting. That night, they hold a banquet with delicious food and everyone seems to be enjoying themselves. Ronan looks around and says that he was curious since this was the entrance ceremony banquet, but this is really grand. Maya notes this is the best institution for learning after all, so this much is to be expected. Asel asks if he met with his sister right before she left, and Ronan says that he did. It took him a good while to reassure her, since she is very worried about him. He also left Sita with her, so he doesn't have to worry about her returning home safely. Asel notes that he is truly one amazing brother, which Ronan thinks that is only natural. Well, after a long and eventful day, it is time to eat, so he should get to it. That's when Schlieffen pops up from behind him like a ghost and interrupts him before he can take a single bite out of the meat. This makes Ronan jump and ask him just what he wants this time around. Schlieffen says that he doesn't want anything in particular. He is just here to check on something important. Ronan asks what that might be, and Schlieffen begins his assault of questions. Where does Iris live, and how far it is from here? How are the road conditions there? Is the security good? And if there are any frequent bandit accidents around the area? All of these questions puzzle Ronan quite a bit, but Schlieffen continues nonetheless. He did employ some guards, right? He trusts that he at least employed some mercenaries to escort her home. Ronan screams at him that he did that, and who he employed is much stronger than all of them. Unless a wyvern descends from its nest and lands straight on the carriage, nothing will happen, so he can just relax. This takes Schlieffen by surprise, as it means that Iris will die if a wyvern appears, right? Ronan tells him that this is enough. He is too crazy about these things. Why is he worried about his sister anyways? Is he her husband or something? Schlieffen freezes up and explains that he is just worried about her, since they acquainted and all. Suddenly the woman with purple hair comes around and notes that this is quite an interesting sight, as she has never seen him so chatty before. Schlieffen asks what business she has with him and calls her by the name of Akalusia. This is Elizabeth Akalusia and is the freshman top of the magic class. She tells him to not be mistaken about things, as she has no business with him and is rather interested in Ronan. He asks why that would be the case, and Schlieffen sighs, as this must be her evil hobby. With that, he leaves, and tells her that she can do as she pleases. Before doing so, however, he suggests sending a guard from his family to Iris, but Ronan tells him off one last time. Asel thugs on his shirt and notes that there was something going on with that girl from earlier. Ronan notes that he doesn't need to explain, as he felt it too, that she was quite powerful. In fact, she is overwhelmingly so for a mage. She explains that those who bear their claws so easily must be taught a lesson. Surely he knows what she means, right? Ronan notes that he doesn't. But why did she want to see him anyway? Elizabeth explains that she was simply very impressed by his talent, so she is here to make him an offer, a special one, that someone as mere as him couldn't just refuse. She pulls out a pendant, and Ronan looks at it, knowing that it is Akalusia's invitation. The Akalusias are a noble family, but unlike most nobles who prioritize bloodline above all else, Akalusia prioritizes talent above all else. In the past, they have debuted many talented individuals and secured their position as one of the two pillars of the empire. They offer an opportunity to those who show potential to become part of the family, which Ronan has just received. This is the symbol of all that, an invitation into their family. Ronan asks if she is just allowed to hand this over as she pleases, making her think that he already knows what it is, for him to be asking that question. He look at the symbol, and remembers the chat he had with Adishan about it, who was also an Akalusia. She explained that if he received this, he needed to pass a test given by the Patriarch, and that he would be a part of this famous and prestigious family. He should keep this in mind, as after he atones for his sins with his accomplishments in this war, he may end up also receiving an invitation. This made him feel quite strange, 
and that same feeling still lingers even now. Elizabeth tells him that he should think about it and make a wise choice. Even if he was born a beast, if he mingles among these sheep, he will just become a part of the flock. With that, she leaves, and Asel is quite glad. Ronan says that these geniuses do as they please around here, but thinks that it's good he has a method of contact now. The Akalusias will definitely prove useful for him. This academy is one that prioritizes a student's abilities above anything else. Depending on one's grades around here, their environment can change greatly. The most representative side of this is how the dormitory system works. The people who are intermediate rank are assigned to the Nataya Hall. Each person in there is provided with a clean room, a high-grade cafeteria, and much more. It is a pretty nice place, where one gets all of their daily necessities with ease. On the other hand, those who make up the bottom 30% are assigned to Crater Hall. And usually, the first day in the Crater Hall goes like this, with the shouting of the students, especially the nobles who fell wronged about the school sending them to a place like this, broken and run down. One of the academy workers explains that they will not be provided any servants, as there are no employees in this hall. It is also four people per room, and the cafeteria, shower, and bathroom are all shared. These are just the academy's rules, so they should study hard and get out of this place as soon as they can. Otherwise, they will also be staying in here the next semester too. And last but not least, the top 10% of the students, including Ronan in this case, are assigned to the Naberdozer Hall. One can describe this place in just one phrase. This is truly a very nice place. Ronan is surprised that they would accommodate mere students like this. And they also receive the class registration form on their table already. He is just supposed to write down what class he wants to take on this timetable. It is important to get adjusted into this place in the first year. So he heard it is not wise to choose many classes. But all of these look very interesting. This is a common misunderstanding of someone who has yet to experience the hell of multiple classes in a single day. Eventually he finished, and his timetable is quite full, but since he is in Filion and all, he should take all of the classes he wants. That same day, one of the instructors kick him out almost instantly, as he doesn't need to take this class. This is the instructor of the Empire Swordsmanship Basics, Abar. Ronan asks why that is, as he has just begun. Abar explains it simply, it is exactly as he says, they have just begun yet he has mastered all of the Empire's swordsmanship techniques instantly. The rules of the Academy state that if a student learned everything, they should leave that class, and if he were to stay, he wouldn't do anything but demotivate the other students. With that said, he shouldn't be so prideful, and continue to move forward. Later that day, Ronan sits at the lake saddened by how this day went. He didn't get kicked out just from the swordsmanship lessons, but also the bowmanship and monster hunting classes. Why did they all have to kick him out? Suddenly, Nabi Rose appears and asks why he isn't in class. But she can probably figure it out, that he completed all of those easily. Ronan confirms that is the case, and wonders if all of the classes are like this. Maybe Fillion can't do any better than this. Nabi Rose is pleasantly surprised that he managed to complete all of those classes in a single day. But it is to be expected from someone like him. It only took him one day to copy her technique after all. She notes that she can't turn a blind eye to this, and asks him for his sword. She will now be teaching him a very important lesson. Ronan wonders what it is, but that's when she strikes near his head, and into the water, creating a rainbow of sorts. Nabarose explains that this is to be expected from a chunk of metal that is his sword. Something like this cannot be called a true weapon, as it only wears down the owner's power. He should watch closely what a real weapon can do. She pulls it out and in that second, basically splits the lake in two with just one strike. Ronan is extremely shocked by her power, and she notes that perhaps he gets it now, what he is truly missing here. A weapon is categorized as a piece of steel that is sturdy and sharp, and it shouldn't break when wielded. And even if it does, one can just obtain a new one. It is expandable. This is what Ronan thought, until he saw this display. This is just ridiculous, as he is certain that she used the sword that is in her hands. But when he used it, with the same slash, it was much smaller. Nabaros explains that one breath and a handful of strength is all that is needed to put one's life on the line if they are on the battlefield. So wasting strength isn't wise. And if he uses mana, then it is essential he finds a weapon that suits him. Of course, it's something that he still can't get. 
because he doesn't know how to use mana just yet. Ronan's hand shakes, and he asks her if she knew all of this time. She did, and tells him that even with this, he has a lot of energy, which she finds quite amazing. One day, he will be able to use mana, so in order to use all of that power he has, he needs to have a weapon that suits him. However now, it looks like he has a lot on his mind, so he should attend his class. Ronan asks if he really can, and she notes that he can. Even though those who have reached second year are the ones allowed to, she will make an exception and let him attend. However, instead of that steel shaped like a sword, he should bring a real, proper weapon. That is the only condition for him to attend her class. Ronan explained what happened to his friends and goes to a blacksmith on his first day off, with Sita also returning. This is the place that Schlieffen told him about when giving him the medallion, so it should be quite good. Asel asks if this is a forge, as it is quite shabby. Maria concurs, as it looks like it could collapse at a moment's notice. Ronan notes that this place was recommended by a noble, so they should go inside already. They do so but find it empty and quite dusty. There is only one door far back in the forge, which opens slowly, and out of it comes a giant wolfman who asks who they are. Why are they so loud in the middle of the day? Don't they see that the fire is out? Ronan finds it quite fascinating that a wolf beast man is in a forge, who asks them to leave already, as this isn't the time for smithing. Ronan pulls out the Grancia family symbol, and notes that he came here to buy a weapon, as Schlieffen recommended this place heavily. The beastman analyzes all of them carefully, and asks why he would care. Is he a Grancia too, or not? He sighs, and notes that he doesn't know who leaked this place, but he should get lost, as he doesn't serve customers like him. Well, maybe there is a way. If they hand over the arm of that soft-looking guy, they can work something out. He was getting hungry anyways, so this should do quite nicely. Asel is extremely scared, but on the other hand, Ronan is extremely angry. He grabs the beastman's attention and says that he crossed the line way too much. In that second, he strikes him with all of his might, which sends the beastman flying. Ronan notes that something is strange, and the fact that he didn't get slashed is even more so. Out of nowhere, a set of armor appears on the beastman, which surprises Ronan's companions. But not him, as it doesn't matter if he has armor on him, he just needs to break it down to get to the meat. The beastman pleads with him to wait, as this was just a test. Ronan asks him to explain himself, and the beastman notes that they do this to people they have never seen before to test them. It is only protocol to verify their skills. They also wanted to test out his invisible armor, so he provoked him on purpose. He meant no harm to any of them. He promises this. Ronan thinks that this is a very original excuse, but why would he actually believe what he just said? The Beastman urges him to think about, wouldn't a smithy used by the great Gracia family have some sort of test like this? If he still doubts him, even now, why doesn't he confirm it with Schlieffen later? Ronan sheathes his sword and notes that the test is quite risky, as he almost died because of it. The Beastman laughs and notes that was his own fault for going overboard. He also apologizes to Asel for scaring him like that, and notes that he shouldn't worry, as he doesn't actually eat people. With that out of the way, he presents himself. He is Didikon, and is an apprentice at this forge, and sometimes, also the gatekeeper. He asks Ronan for his name, who obliges. He notes that he heard about him coming for a weapon, so he should follow him, as this place is just the entrance. The real place is beyond this door. They all get into a pretty small room, which is empty, and pushes a secret button while telling everyone to be prepared, since they will be witness of something truly extraordinary. The floor starts descending, and Ronan asks what this system is. Didikon explains that it is an elevator made from magic stone and a pulley, the fastest way to get to the real forge. And what they are seeing right now, through the glass, is the largest and best forge in the capital, Grand Carpadoki. Ronan finds something so large existing underground quite ridiculous. Didi can't understand why he would say something like that, but he should be excited as he passed the test, and to take responsibility, he will take him to one of the best craftsmen in the whole capital. Ronan looks at all of the blacksmiths working diligently on their various crafts, and is surprised that there were so many in this forge, underneath the capital, of all places. Diki Khan notes that indeed, this is something very precious, and this forge only gives items to the royal family, 
as well as some selected nobles. Without any discrimination of race or gender, all the skilled master craftsmen are allowed to show their talents in here. However, the best of the best, the one which everyone agrees is the best of all of them, is the Elder Dwarf, who lives right in this house. He is someone unrivaled in his talents, and a master that has melted metal for well over 400 years. He can also be quite stubborn, since he is so old, but his skills are worth it, so they should respect him, says Dikikon, while kicking the door open with full force. Countless weapons and armor lie on the ground, and Dikikon says that he has brought some most important guests. The old master tells Dikikon off, as he warned him plenty of times to not enter so loudly when he's working, but like the bastard he is, he just doesn't listen. Dikikon excuses his behavior by explaining that he had no choice, as there were weapons piling in front of the door, so he couldn't open it like a normal person. He should clean after himself, since he is the Elder Doron. He notes that, for one that is so young, he nags like a hundred-year-old hag. But besides that, he has brought guests, so he presumes that they are not bad. Dikikon explains that it's only natural. He tested this boy directly, and he passed with flying colors, as his sword skills are great and rather deadly. Doron is surprised by this, as judging by looks only, he looks like a simple child, with a strange companion. He asks Ronan to show him his swordsmanship, as he can tell a lot, just by watching him at work. Ronan obliges and pulls his sword out, but the moment he does, Daron begins analyzing it thoroughly, and eventually breaks it in two, as it is straight rubbish. Everyone from the group is extremely surprised by what just happened, and Ronan gets furious, asking why he did that. Before things can get out of proportion, Daron points to the pile of weaponry on the ground and tells him to show his skills with one of the swords from there. With the trashy sword that he had previously, he wouldn't have been able to accurately get a sense of his true skill. Additionally, he will give him the sword he chose for free, no strings attached, since any sword he will choose now will be a thousand times better than the trash he came in with. Ronan wonders if it is so, and looks at Dikikon for confirmation, who nods confidently. Without much choice, he picks up one of the swords, and fells that it has a completely different vibe. But will it really be so different from his sword? Ronan warns Daron that if he destroys anything, it's not his fault. But Daron doesn't care, noting that he should do it probably, by putting all that he has into that one swing. Ronan looks at the sword, and thinks about what technique to use. His mind immediately jumps to the technique Nabarose used to split the river, so he accurately copies the movements and stands ready to strike like he is in a life-and-death situation. Daron recognizes those movements all too well, but before he can stop him, Ronan unleashes the attack forwards, and a large explosion occurs in front of the forge, which grabs the attention of everyone nearby. They wonder what is going on, as it's just midday. Did his blast furnace blow up, perhaps? Ronan stands with the sword still pointed forwards, as he just took out the whole front of the building, and asks, Just what the hell happened? He tries to excuse this, as it wasn't his intention, but Daron doesn't care, and recognizes that what he just used was Nabarose's technique. Is he her apprentice, perhaps? Ronan asks if he knows her, and he says that he more than knows her, as he was the one that made the blade that she uses now. Ronan is surprised that he made a sword so stupidly long, and Daron explains that the sword is a secret sword, that goes by the name of Urusa. It's one of the few masterpieces that he forged throughout his entire life and right now, He's holding something that can't even compare, but it feels nice, right? Ronan notes that it actually feels amazing, and at first he didn't think there was much to the sword. Daron says that he should be the one to tell him that, as he thought he was a newbie, who couldn't judge his skills well. But in actuality, he is a talented swordmaster, something he hasn't seen in a long time. He pats him on the back with extreme force, and tells him that being too talented is also a problem as it will be hard to forge a sword that can truly be called his. Especially since he swung that sword only once, but it's already cracking from the immense pressure. What he needs is not normal materials, but some high-grade steel, and also special material to help it keep steady. Perhaps the byproduct of a wyvern would suffice, as that is extremely resistant. After hearing this, Ronan hands him something that he brought, as he thought it could have been useful, the eggshell, that is now in two pieces. Daron attempts to crack the shell with his hammer, but try as he might, he just can't get through it. He is extremely surprised, as this hammer is made out of mithril, but it couldn't make a dent in this eggshell. 
What is it made out of? He is now extremely excited and asks if he can really use that most valuable thing in his crafting. Ronan agrees, as it's literally useless for him, but that's enough for him to make a good sword, right? Daron, now more fired up than ever, says that it's plenty and he should come back in two weeks, as a sword that rivals the Empire's best will be in his hands. Ronan notes that he will be looking forward to it, and Daron tells Asel and Maria to go meet with the other masters, as he can't send them back empty-handed, and if they tell them that he was the one who sent them, they will look after them with great care. He would have liked to do it, but at this moment, re-smelting this is his only purpose in life. He smashes it with the hammer, and the others watch with confusion, as he finds way too much enjoyment in this. Below ground, exactly below the group in fact, there is a large tunnel, and a woman notes that she is tired of how the blacksmiths above are extremely annoying beings. The man behind her notes that he feels the same, and he wants to set them on fire now, but she tells him to hold back, as it is not yet time to reveal themselves. It will not be much longer anyways. They will start with these worthless blacksmiths, and then everything in the empire will be buried under the true light of the world. A few days later, while walking around the school grounds, Ronan thinks about what happened. Daron promised to make him an extremely good sword, worthy of his talent. Additionally, Asel and Maria put in commissions with the craftsmen there, which will be quite expensive, but that doesn't really matter to him, as it's not his money anyway. The only real problem that remains is that it will take an entire fortnight for his new sword to be completed. He wonders what he should do in that time, as both Asel and Maria must be in their respective classes, so he can't call on them. That's when he passes the Galilean building, where there is exclusive training and lectures for the upper-class students. He is pretty sure that Nabarose also has her classes in here too, and she told him to come after he got a real weapon, so he postponed it. But now, he at least has something temporary, so he should go. In that second, Nabarose pops up besides him, and he is extremely scared by this. She pinches his ear off, and notes that it has been a long while since they met. If her memory serves her right, which it does, she told him to come to class the moment he got a new weapon. So what has he been doing all of this time, skipping class? Ronan tries to explain the situation, but she doesn't listen to a word of his, and continues to pinch his ear off while walking with him towards the building. He starts screaming to let go, and a familiar face hears it, as she was besides the window. That's when someone bumps into her, and tells her to not block the path, and move already. If she has enough time to laze around in here, she should go and prepare for the lesson, like the loser she is. She says that she will go soon, and looks out of the window, as a familiar scene washes over her. In the first sparring room, Nabarose introduces Ronan to everyone else. They probably know who he is already, since he made quite a ruckus during the interview, but she will introduce him to everyone again, since they might not know. He is named Ronan, and from now on, will be attending class with all of them. Ronan bows down and also introduces himself, which makes the other students immediately judge his appearance, with most noting that he looks too frail to be able to do anything, realistically. Ronan can hear everything they are saying, and he's rather annoyed. There are also some welcome faces around here, and some rather unwelcome ones, let's say, so things will be fun. Suddenly someone opens the door and apologizes for being late. Ronan's eyes widen as he recognizes that voice. She apologizes again and again for being late, but Nabarose says it's fine, as they just finished introducing the new guy, so she should go say hi. She turns to him and explains that she is the second year martial arts major, who is also the ta for this class. Her name is Adishan, and it's very nice to meet him. Adishan Akalushia was acknowledged for her incredible commanding abilities and was the first woman to rise to the grand commander role while also dominating the battlefield with her famous cool-headed judgment and outstanding leadership. Thus, she got the title of the Iron Lady, and those who have been under her direct command always say, inside her body runs not blood, but cold and fine iron. Ronan wonders, who would have guessed, that someone as great as her could have such a calm expression. It's very clear that she has no memories of the regression, so she has turned to her original self, and that means that he has to fulfill her request, from way back then, to tell her to just not do anything stupid and become a tailor, like she has always wished to. This puts him into a difficult situation, however, since earlier, everyone was calling her for various things, one to check his technique, one asked to change the towels, and so on. 
She is extremely busy, it seems. Why is she doing all of these small errands that an only an attendant needs to do? Suddenly, someone comes next to him and asks to spar in a duel. He apologizes for being so abrupt with this invitation and introduces himself. He is the third year Cardin own, and he has heard about him and how amazing he was during the interview. If the rumors about him really are true, he would like to learn from him, if possible. Ronan notes that he has a lot on his mind right now, but before he can refuse, Cardan apologizes for not coming for a duel with a weapon, so he calls that loser Adishan to bring his weapon. Ronan freezes in place, as who does this bastard think he's calling a loser? Eventually, Adishan arrives with the weapon, but Cardan immediately gets on her case, as she brought a long spear, and he recently switched to a short spear. Is she that stupid, to not remember such vital information? Adishan apologizes, as she saw him a long spear last lesson, so this is why she brought him one. Cardin sees this as her talking back, so he hits her in the head with the wooden part of the spear, continuously. He explains to Ronan that she is someone who doesn't have the right to take this kind of class, and only came here after begging on her knees, that she should be good at chores at least. Ronan is filled more and more with unbridled rage, and eventually he can't contain himself anymore, so he grabs the spear and tells him that they should do it, just like he said. If not, things might become dangerous for everyone. Cardin doesn't understand, but Ronan looks at him with fully killing intent and tells him that they should fight, as he will show him who is the real bastard in this fucking place. Everyone gathers around, and Doran is surprised by what he just heard. Why is he doing this? But ah, uh, he already knows. It's because of that commoner loser behind him. Does he even know her though? Or are they both lowly commoners? Are they perhaps from the same disgusting commoner family? Ronan hands him his weapon and tells him to just shut up and take his beating with at least a bit of grace if he doesn't want to end up in a grave. He hits him with a light jab, which sends him flying backwards and also cracking his spear. Ronan notes that he was whining before about not getting the right weapon, so he fixed it for him. Doesn't he like that? Cardin sees this as a direct insult to himself, and he charges in out of rage, exuding as much mana as possible, and asking if he really thinks he will be fine after this much disrespect. Ronan stands still while the attack approaches, but before it can even touch a hair of his, he cuts the spears into tiny pieces, and says that he will be very fine, so he should worry about himself more. He hits him with a barrage of attacks, every move being harder and swifter than the last. Eventually, he knocks him out fully, and tells him to be thankful that they are in the academy, as if this was outside, his lifeless body would have been thrown to the wolves. Everyone is surprised that Cardin lost, as he was the highest ranked throughout the first years. Ronan notes that it's time to move to the next target, and points at the scamp who complained about the towels. If they smell, she should wash them herself. Why is she making someone else do it for her? Is the assistant instructor her servant or something, huh? Ronan continues to move forwards, but Adishan stops him, as she doesn't know exactly why she's doing this. But it's okay. He should just stop. Ronan tells her once, to move, as he can hold back when it comes to other things, but not when she is being looked down on like this. Not by these idiots, not by anyone in this damn empire. Nobody serves the right to do that, after all that she had one. He pushes her out of the way, as these guys deserve a stern beating, one that they will never forget. Suddenly, Nabarose appears behind him and demands that he stop. She will not ask him to take responsibility for what he did earlier, since in a real battle, that guy would have been long dead. However, if he escalates things like this even further, she can no longer look the other way. He will drop his sword and walk away. Ronan can't seem to move, and when he looks behind, he sees Nabirose's aura, a giant snake, ready to strike at a moment's notice. He knew that she was strong, but he didn't know that she was this strong, to have this kind of aura. She tells him that, what he was going to go through with, cannot be considered a spar, and as the person responsible for everyone around here, she cannot let anyone else be injured. Ronan says that she should have known already, what the assistant was going through. Up until now, she just stood by, and watched everything happened, despite knowing, Nabi Rose explains that this is between her and the assistant, and it doesn't involve him in the slightest. This is his last warning to stop, or else she will have to deploy drastic measures. Ronan notes that it doesn't matter, if she's the sword saint or not, his answer remains the same. Her, and the whole damn empire, can fuck right off. 
Nabaros says that there is no helping it, and uses the grieving snake on him, something which makes him smile with anticipation. Ronan remembers how he asked Adishan before, why did she volunteer for the commander position when everybody else declined? At the time, she told him that one day, he will understand eventually, there are some things that he can't force someone else to do. It's his destiny, after all. He was confused by that answer. But what was she thinking, truly? Just what kind of load was she carrying on her shoulders? He remembers when he last saw her. She told him to not forgive her for putting this burn on him, as she doesn't deserve it. He wakes up screaming, and then huffs loudly as he slowly realizes he is awake. Adishan is next to him, and comes close, asking if he has had a nightmare or something. Adishan asks what he's talking about all of a sudden, but Ronan excuses himself, as it was probably just a dream he had. But more importantly, are they in the infirmary right now? Adishan confirms that they are. The instructor told her to bring him here, and additionally to fix that pride of his, as she does not want what happened today to occur again. That is precisely what she said. Ronan thinks that he's in big trouble, and wonders if he should just go back to sleeping. But suddenly, Adishan asks him, did he perhaps get angry back there for her sake? This question makes him jump, and he says that it wasn't. He was just angry because he's sensitive to poor etiquette, and he's a very refined gentleman and all that. Adishan notices that he's lying, but she tells him to not hate any of them, including the guy he beat up, since she kind of understands their feelings after all. Ronan gets mad again and wonders how that's true, as she has been a great assistant instructor. How can they just treat her like this? Since they are talking about it anyway, why was she chosen to be the assistant for that class anyway? Even if she went easy on the various students, and that they did what they did because of this, why did Nabarose just sit by and watch as it happened? Is she not angry at this injustice? Adishan explains that the instructor is doing nothing because she asked her to. She did this because she's getting preferential treatment, which she doesn't deserve in the slightest, as normally to take that class. One would need to be a sword expert, but she's currently being held back for an entire year, and she has barely started to control her mana. Ronan thinks that this is impossible, as Adishan was the best commander ever, and she was able to use an amazing aura. Did she really go through something like this in her past life too? Adishan continues. That is why she told the instructor to do nothing. No matter what happens, she should pretend to not see it. She already took her as her assistant instructor, so she did not want to make her take on an additional task. She is receiving this kind treatment, so being treated like this is nothing. She can handle it, anytime, any day. Adishan still thanks him, however, for today, as she thought she got used to most of the stuff the students did, but today hurt a lot more than it should have. Silence falls for a moment, and Ronan breaks it by asking, Is her objective to become a Grand Commander? Is that why she's going through this? Adishan is surprised that he found out, did she make it that obvious? But yeah, that's her dream. Even if she's lacking in lots of things, her dream is still to become the greatest Grand Commander there ever will be. Naturally, for someone who's not even at the expert level, she knows that saying this might seem dumb, but she's not going to give up. As even if she doesn't have the level, she is confident in military strategy, and she's working hard every single day. That can be clearly seen by how rough her palms are. Eventually, the next class is about to start, so Adishan tells Ronan to rest and come back later. He thanks her for looking after him like this, and she says that it wasn't a problem. With that, she leaves, and Ronan's mind is filled with the Grand Commander's last words to not let her mess around that place anymore and become a tailor instead, as she's always wanted to be one. But now, he's conflicted. What would she want him to do? A few days later, on a sunny weekend, in the forge, at the entrance of Grand Carpadoki, Ronan, Acel, and Maria arrive, but there is nobody inside to welcome them, which is quite weird, as they sent a messenger bird in the middle of the night as his sword was made, and it's apparently the best sword Daron has made yet. Out of sheer anger, he kicks stuff out of the way, and the other two wonder why he's being like this, as it seems he has become more sensitive for some reason. Ronan notes that if they are not going to let them in, they should just let themselves in, Maria asks if they are allowed to do such a thing, and Ronan explains that they are the ones who invited him in here, so they should stop talking about it, and go already. They all go to the elevator room, and Ronan presses the button to start it, which he surprisingly remembered. While they go down, 
He says that he will teach that old man about the basics of customer service, as he appears to have zero knowledge on that. Suddenly, the elevator arrives at the glass part, and they see that the entire place is up in flames, and that most people are on the ground, unconscious, or dead. A cell tells him to look in a certain direction, and when he does, he sees a rock giant that is chasing after the blacksmiths. A cell wonders what they should do, but that's when Ronan grabs her tightly and tells Maria to go back and bring any instructors or whoever she can find that can help. With that, he jumps down with a cell who can barely use telekinesis in her flustered state. Eventually, the blacksmiths are too tired to run anymore, and just when all hope is lost, Ronan strikes its hand with enough force to break it. He notes that this is great timing, as he's been thinking about tons of stuff lately, and they seem like the perfect stress relievers. The rock giant tries to strike Ronan with its remaining hand, and he lets it approach, until it's inches away. That's when he jumps on giant and cuts its head with one swift motion. The giant did not even realize what happened, and its head fell to the ground. The blacksmiths are amazed by that kid, as he took on a rock giant at such a young age. What power. Suddenly, Ronan appears before them, and he asks them to quickly explain what is going on around here. Ronan carefully listens to their story, and he's surprised to find out that dozens of rock giants suddenly attacked in groups. One of the blacksmiths says that they don't even know the reason. They just suddenly appeared out of the ground and started destroying everything, killing blacksmiths in the process. Additionally, one of them grabbed several blacksmiths, including Daron, and returned to where they came from. Didikun decided to give chase, but he isn't that great at fighting, and at this rate, they might all become food, which Ronan knows much about. He notes that if there aren't any more giants left here, they should go. He orders a cell to look for anyone else who is injured, until Maria arrives with backup. He will also hand her Sita, as she can heal the people easier with her. A cell asks what he will do, and Ronan says that it's quite simple. He is going to save the ones who got taken away, as he has something he needs to get from Daron, after all. Somewhere else, Daron is holding the sword he made tightly, and thanks Dikikon for coming here. But there was no need for him to be here, and risk his life like this. He should just run, and get away, while he is still able. Dikikon tells him to shut up, as he has enough on his mind already, so he doesn't need all this crap from him too. If he has such strength, to say dumb things, he should swing that sword around instead of holding it like a baby. Daron says that he can't, as this is his best work yet. He can't just taint it like this with his awful swordsmanship. Dikikon says that he's crazy, even though he knew he was obsessed with weapons and such. Now is not the time to be like this. Suddenly, the rock giants break through the hole they were hiding in, and one of them strikes with all of its might. But Dikikon holds the fist in place, and thinks that with this final hit, the defense enchantment that he put on his armor has been destroyed. But it's kind of sad. As if he knew he was going to die like this, he would have done tons of things. Suddenly, before he can regret further, Ronan arrives. And much to Dikikon's surprise, he cuts the golem into countless pieces. Ronan congratulates him for holding out for so long. But now he can rest, as he will take care of everything. They are both shocked to see him here. And Dikikon asks how he got in here, as there were tons of giants along the way. Ronan explains that they were just fodder. He killed all of them, and saved the blacksmiths that were captured. Dikikon wonders how that's possible, but Ronan tells him to stop speaking about that, and orders Daron to give him the sword, as he can't use the sword he currently has any longer. Daron is confused, and Ronan notes that he's talking about his masterpiece, the sword he made for him. Isn't that what he's carrying right now? Daron finally understands, and hands it to him, while explaining that the hilt is not complete, but he is sure he can still use it well. Ronan picks it up, and says that it's time to see just how much of a masterpiece this sword is. A couple of golems charge in, but with one simple swing, Ronan easily takes all of them out, which surprised all of them, excluding Daron, who is just happy to see his sword doing something. Ronan is amazed by the amount of power he can exert with it, and Daron asks if he likes La Mancha. This is the name of the sword, a name he got from his favorite daydreamer. Even so, this sword is above many, as it's extremely light, and the material is extremely sturdy, rivaling Mithril in fact, so it can withstand any swordsmanship thrown at it. As a nice bonus, the sword has a hidden trait, to restore any damage it takes by absorbing any kind of blood. Ronan notices that it's absorbing the golem blood, and congratulates Daron on a job well done, 
He really did impress with this. Dikikon says that this is not the time for congratulations, as they have to get out of here, since they are most likely the last ones around here. Ronan tells them to go on without him, as he has to check something out. It's not much, but judging by his feeling, it seems that there's a few rats hiding around here, and there's a big one among them too. Dikikon asks him to elaborate, and Ronan explains that something just feels off, as he knows about rock giants and their habits, and they are not known for gathering like this. Additionally, they are very well behaved, if one doesn't annoy them first, that is. If they need more evidence, they should see what's on the back of their heads, a suspicious mark that he hasn't seen before. Daron notes that it's a magic circle, but he's not sure about its origin, as he can only feel the reverberation of the mana, which is quite crafty. This must be the reason the rock golems were acting out, but who could have done such a gruesome thing? Ronan has no clue either, but he feels that soon, they will certainly find out, one way or another. With that, he begins sprinting across the numerous halls. Previously, he thought that he might have been wrong, but now, he's certain that there's someone here, as there are human footsteps. And there's a defense mana stone too. The people who did this really planned every single detail out. Suddenly, Ronan hears talking and hides behind a wall as he wants to hear what they are talking about. But that's when he notices the giant golem that is present in the room. And judging by this scene, those two robed people are the ones behind this. But what could that giant golem be? He has never seen anything of the sort. Suddenly, he hears the two strangers talking about an intruder, as the brainwashing link they cast on the giants has been tampered with, and it was probably done by a third party. One of them is quite annoyed, as it seems that the Imperial dogs have acted on this pretty fast. What should they do now, though? They have no giants left, and they can't operate this big one just yet. Since the situation became so drastic, should he just go and slaughter everyone? The woman, who calls him Eduan, says that the situation is still salvageable, as they destroyed most of the surrounding facilities, and that will greatly affect the Empire's weapon output. They can't do anything now anyway, as if their identities are revealed. That person will not sit still at all, so they should retreat. This woman is called Cyrilla, and Eduan notes that she's quite rigid, but alas, they have no other choice, so they will do as she says. He asks if he should get rid of that, and she tells him to do as he pleases. Eduan then notes that this is dedicated to the one that has been spying on them, as the smell of sulfur coming from the smithy is getting on his nerves already. He then unleashes a fire attack on Ronan, which explodes pretty widely. But Ronan naturally still stands, as he has dodged that attack. Eduan is glad to have someone new to play with, as he seems like quite the agile toy. But he will put him in his place first, as he summons tons of fire attacks that stop inches away from Ronan, who thinks that this guy is not just an average mage, as materializing magic this fast is a skill, for sure. Eduan asks how he got here, as the defense system they put in place was not easy to break through, he's sure about that. Ronan notes that he wanted to ask them the same question. Just who are they? Even if they really wanted to meet with each other, isn't meeting in such a place quite weird? Eduan says that this guy is tons of fun, but Cyrilla tells him to stop wasting time, as they have plenty of stuff to do. He tells her that it's fine, he needs to have some fun, before this empire is buried entirely in starlight. Ronan's eyes become clear as he hears this. These were the last words of a high Ute, the giant he killed in his past life. Ronan asks them, do they even know what those words mean? What they entail? Damn fucking rats. Eduan is puzzled as to why the mood changed so suddenly, and Ronan orders the both of them to come with him, as he has tons of fun questions to ask them. Eduan smiles, as he has never seen such a confident brat before. He tries to ask him if he can get out of the situation he's in right now, but he doesn't get to, as Ronan cuts off his hand instantly. He explains that it's very possible for him to get out of anything, so they are both screwed. Eduan screams as he crawls to his arm, and Cyrilla is stunned, as she doesn't know what to do. Ronan suddenly grabs her by the neck and clenches tightly. He explains that she should answer his questions obediently and not cause a fuss, if she doesn't want to end up like her little friend, that is. Ronan continues to threaten Cyrilla, but even if she's scared, she has had enough and activates her mana shield, which send Ronan back. But he isn't distraught in the slightest by this and instead cuts at it in seconds and stabs Cyrilla's shoulder with his blade. That's when Ronan notices that she's a half-elf but what are they doing for her to be associated with such an organization? 
Suddenly, from behind him, Edouan unleashes a mighty explosion, but Ronan is swift and cuts it away, making it land on the golem behind him. Ronan is surprised to see him standing, as he already cut his limbs off. But when he looks, he sees that Edouan's limbs were replaced with a kind of wood. Edouan demands that he get away from Cirilla this instant. But instead of that, Ronan stabs her in the leg and notes that it seems they have not yet grasped the situation they are in. He will make it clear, however, they are screwed beyond repair. But he will give them a choice. They will either listen obediently to him and answer his every question, or he will give this half-elf a nice amputation. Perhaps she will also grow her limb back, right? Reluctantly, Edouan deactivates his power and accepts his offer. He will follow him. Ronan congratulates him for making the smart choice, as he also doesn't want to spill more blood than he needs to. That's when he notices that Cirilla is smiling from ear to ear, but before Ronan can even wonder why, he notices that the giant golem is trying to crush him, which he tries to block, but he is still sent into the wall from the sheer force. After the dust clears, Edouan asks Cirilla if she can still move, and she confirms that she can, while also thanking him for the help. If he hadn't diverted his attention then, with his attack, she wouldn't have had time to use magic and hinder his perception, nor have the time to activate the giant. Although it was only his arm that he activated, that damn child is surely damaged. Edouan tells her to go to the church and report to the church about it. He will come too, but only after he's done with this guy. Cirilla warns him to be careful, as he has already done too much damage. But Edouan knows full well that this thing is no child. It's a demon. That if he doesn't kill now, he will become a huge threat. The moment he sees Ronan is the moment he is cut up into a hundred pieces until he is sure that he cannot regenerate anymore. He then asks Cirilla, where is she going? He thought that he made it perfectly clear already that he has a lot to ask. Before Ronan can make another move, his body gives up from the fatigue and he falls on one knee. He tries his best to move it, but it's just not responding. He's stuck in this position. Cirilla thinks that this is really lucky. Even if it came to this, they can at least guarantee that she can report this to the higher-ups. That is the priority here. She opens a portal and tells Ronan to prepare himself. But even if he does that, she will make sure to find everything about him and take away everything from him. His family, lover, friends, she will destroy it all. Ronan is in a state of desperation at this point, as he managed to find a clue about the future. But if he lets her go, things will not change at all, so he tells her to stop with all of his might. But that's when, out of nowhere, Nabarose appears and demands Cirilla to stop, which she does instantly, as the pressure is too much. She has a lot of questions for her, but she will confirm, first and foremost, did she really dare to touch her disciple? She also congratulates Ronan for what he did and for holding out for so long. He notes that her timing is impeccable and that he's very glad to see her here. With that, she shifts her attention to Cirilla, who cannot move at all, as Nabarose's aura has paralyzed her from head to toe. How can one have this power? Before she can even think of running away, Nabarose grabs her head and says that she has committed a few things she should have never committed. But the most grave one is that she harmed her disciple's body. Now, she will look into her future with her own two eyes. The aura snake opens its mouth, and the only thing Cirilla can do now is apologize to her stars. Naturally, she faints, and Nabarosa congratulates Ronan once again. But now, after they treat his injuries, they will report all of this to the principal. Before she can continue, Ronan asks about the future she mentioned. Was she perhaps talking about the Laudlin prison? Nabarose confirms that she indeed was. But why is he interested? Ronan was right on the mark. Lodolin is titled The Fortress of Screams, and it's in the middle of the sea. It is famous for interrogating criminals who have dared to go against the Empire, and they use all sorts of methods in order to receive every ounce of information from someone. Knowing this, Ronan asks to observe their interrogation, which Nabarose says that it isn't appropriate, as it's a dark place. Ronan grabs her hand and explains that he only wants to go just this once. He begs her to allow him, as this is extremely important to him. Everyone around the forge, who was left alive, is now getting proper treatment, and Maria is glad that everything is dealt with. Asel also feels the same, as she and Sita are poofed. Still, she hopes that Ronan is coming back soon, as she doesn't want to think about something happening to him. Suddenly he appears, 
and notes that he heard the summary of what they did here. They really worked hard on this. While Maria brought more and more backup, Asel and Sita saved over half of the people who were buried. He also asks them if they are in a hurry, but they should be asking that, as he is full of wounds and doesn't look well at all. Asel tells Sita to heal him, but the little guy can't do that, as it doesn't have any mana. Ronan tells them to relax, as he has already received treatment, and now there is something that he has to do. A few hours later, at the secret rendezvous for Lodolin's convoy, specifically at the Grengo Forest Cliff, Nabarose and Ronan wait for Lodolin's escorts, and they eventually arrive on a gigantic crow creature. They get down and announce that they have been called here by the Empire in order to escort the criminals. Nabarose shows them the perpetrators and warns that the male has regenerative abilities, so they should be careful. One of them says that they will, but the interrogator will be very happy with this, as such a fun object will be a great toy to play with. With that, they grab them and say that they will contact them after the interrogation is over. They should continue to work hard for the prosperity of the Empire. Nabi Rose explains that probably, in one week, those bastards will open their mouths, and she will let him know once they do. That should be enough, right? Ronan confirms it, and also thanks her for the opportunity. After this, time moved quickly, and the restoration of Carpadoki quickly went underway, thanks to the Empire's support. Ronan returned to the Empire, and started to train even more diligently with Nabaros. And a few days later after that, at Lodolin, the captive's torture continued. But today is special, as a special guest will arrive soon. Nabaros and Ronan arrive at the prison, and a man welcomes them, while also introducing himself as the interrogator who has been in charge of interrogating the new criminal, and the one who is in charge, Karaka. He explains that he will show them the criminal first, and tell them details on the way. They agree, and Ronan notes that he did not expect such a nice-looking old man to be an interrogator in this place. Nabaros smiles, as everyone who meets him first says that, but he shouldn't judge him now, as he will find out soon why he is called the worst nightmare. While they are near the cell, Karaka gives them a summary, and the first thing he will tell them is about the Nebula Clazier. That is the name of the organization they are a part of. This is the first time Nabirose heard about them, and so she asks, is it a criminal organization, like Kaliboro? Karaka confirms that it is, but it is much more dangerous, as from the great fire that destroyed the Nalanda Granary, to the explosion at the magic engineering facility, Ataman, it has been confirmed that they were behind these cases. Ronan is surprised, as he has never heard of them in his past life. While Karaka tries to explain further, Ronan interrupts him and asks, did they perhaps use the word Starlight or Star's Advent in any way? He confirms that they didn't, and Ronan notes that it's just something he heard from them while they were fighting. Perhaps it has something to do with their goal. Karaka swiftly grabs his mask and slowly puts it on, while his expression changes instantly. Ronan is shocked by this, as the kind old man that was in front of him just now transformed into a maniac. Karaka opens the door to their chamber and notes that he's quite ashamed by this, as it seems like he was not able to show them the sincerity of his actions. Ronan looks inside and is shocked to see Eduan and Cyrilla in extremely poor states. Karaka explains that Eduan is quite an amusing toy, as he regenerates using his specialized dark magic, but if he gets burned, he can no longer regenerate, and after that, he cut his limbs off and put effort into the torture. That is how they became the bestest of friends. That is what he believed anyway, but friends don't hide stuff from each other. Did they not agree to be sincere with each other? Eduan notes that he told him everything, he swears, so Karaka asks him about the star's advent. For his information, he would like this conversation to stop with him, as Cyrilla does not possess regenerative abilities, so if he doesn't comply, he will focus his attention on her. Does he really want that? Softly, Cyrilla begs for death, but this makes Ronan think, can Eduan really withhold information in that state? That's when he tells everyone that maybe... It's not that he's not saying it, but maybe he can't. There are methods used on soldiers to protect secrets, to be able to withhold information, with a forbidden magic cast on the respective soldier. Karaka lets him go, and notes that he can't believe he missed something so obvious. They should also wait here a bit, as he needs to get something. Eventually, he comes back with a cursed eye, a monster that eats curses. It's quite useful for people like Eduan, who cannot say certain things. After explaining, he puts it on Eduan's head, 
and the monster crawls under his skin and directly into his brain, which consumes the curse that has been put on him. Karaka asks again, who is the star's advent? Eduan explains that the star is an eternal entity, the only grace that will save them, the lowly beings, from Earth. As the small lights, who are waiting for the star's advent beyond the skies, they work to ensure that nothing interferes with their wish. Cirilla tells him to shut up, and Karaka notes that from what he understood, something will fall from the sky soon. But what is it? That's when Eduan says it. The star's children. Which makes Ronan clench his whole body, as a Hayute was one of those too. Ronan walks next to Eduan and asks, the children of the start that he is talking about, is he talking about a Hayute? Eduan asks how he knows of such a thing, but before long, his body starts to swell and Karaka protects Ronan with his magic, as the explosion was quite volatile. Karaka did not expect this, and Ronan asks if this is a usual thing for him. Karaka explains that it doesn't happen often, as it's rare for things to get to this point, but it was probably because the curse was cast in two parts. The first part was to not reveal anything about the organization and the star's advent, and the second, when the word he said was mentioned, the curse would explode within him. So, he will have to ask now, what is a Hayute? If his theory is correct, that information is secret even within Nebula Clazier, so how did he get it? As the interrogator he must know, so he will have to answer, now. Ronan explains that he coincidentally came to know it, as he heard it when he was eavesdropping on them. At first he thought it wasn't important, but upon coming here, he changed his mind. So, he apologizes for interfering, is that enough to please him? Karaka knows full well that he's hiding the truth, but he doesn't think he's of any danger to the Empire, as his eyes are filled with something. Willpower, maybe, or better yet, it's anger, directed at these prisoners. Nabiro swiftly puts her blade at Karaka's neck and tells him to stop, as she doesn't believe he dared to question her disciple in front of her. Karaka apologizes, as he is double-checking everything. Ronan says that it's fine, but he's glad that he got out scot-free this time. Karaka says that it's a shame they lost a cursed eye, as they are very hard to kill. Ronan asks if it really is that powerful, and Karaka explains that it is, but that's when he notices that its eye is glistening. Did it absorb a curse? But from who? That's when he remembers that he touched Ronan's shoulder, so he grabs the eye and puts it on Ronan's hand. Before long, the creature explodes, meaning that inside of Ronan there's a curse that it cannot handle, so Karaka tells him that he's cursed. He also asks him, has he ever felt restrictions regarding day-to-day -day movements? Perhaps he can't run, or hold objects made from steel. He's asking if something happened like that. Ronan just stays silent, which tells Karaka everything he needs to know, but he will not press further, but he should know this. Judging from the curse's power, it was cast with extreme amounts of ill intent. Shortly after this, it's time for the guest to leave, and Karaka explains that as soon as he lifts the spell from Cirilla fully, he will let them know, as it will take time. He also looks at Ronan, and notes that he must have a lot on his mind. He confirms it, as he just found out his body is cursed, but Karaka tells him to not worry, as he is a Philian student, and that place holds the only mage in the continent that knows everything about curses, Maya's secret. While leaving the prison, Ronan keeps rubbing his eyes in the carriage, and Nabiros notes that he has been doing that since getting in the carriage. Is it that itchy? Ronan says that it's been a while since it started happening, but he knows it began ever since he has touched that eyeball monster. Is there something wrong with him after all? Nabiros tells him to relax, as this is one of the common symptoms that appear when a curse is getting weaker. So it's actually good. However, does he still not have a clue as to why a curse was cast on him in the first place? Ronan can't think of one, as surely, he has lived the life of a saint so he really doesn't know who would have ill intentions towards him. Nabiros finds it hard to believe that, but her thoughts are interrupted by Ronan thanking her for what she did back in Lodolan. When the interrogator approached him, he could feel the intense pressure from only his eyes, and if she wasn't there, he would have made up something to confess. Even though he didn't do anything, he was that scary. Nabiros tells him that she was just doing what every instructor should, there is no need for thanks. Ronan looks at her and thinks that she is not only extremely skilled, but also a good person. The more he gets to know her personally, the more she seems to be a nice person. But something is really strange about her. As even if she is so great, he didn't hear a single thing about her in his past life. Could Nabi Rose have done something unforgivable to the Empire? If not that, 
then who really knows at this point? The next day in the training area for magic students, the Sherry Forest, there is a location called the Pillar Park. At the entrance of the park stand Ronan and Adishan, who notes that it's been a long time since they last met each other, but it was because of the instructor's grace that they were able to. Anyways, how has he been this past few days? Ronan just looks at her with a confused look, as he hasn't thought of what to do about her yet. Actually, he just didn't have the time to think about what he should do, but for now, he will just pretend like everything is normal and laugh it off. He says that it has truly been a long time since they have met, and asks how she's been doing. Adishan explains that after what happened, all of the guys who were scared of Cardin became much more friendly, although she is quite concerned about Cardan himself, as he gets scared every time he sees her and starts screaming. She must say, it's really not that bad of a feeling though. They walk inside of the park, and Adishan seems to have heard from the instructor that he has a curse that needs undoing. Ronan explains that it's true, as it just kind of popped up, but he heard that he would have to meet one professor's secret. So he came here to do so, but this place is quite strange, so he wouldn't be surprised if Secret was also the same as this place. Adishan notes that the professor is a really unique person, with a very unique office, so non-magic students don't even dare to come here. So that is why she asked a younger magic student for guidance. She must have been here by now though. Suddenly a shadowy figure appears in front of her and charges to grab her, but this was actually a hug from Eri, because she was happy to see her since they haven't talked in a while. Ronan just looks at this with a plain face, and remembers that this girl is the same one who was constantly yapping about the wolf and the sheep of this world. Akalusha Elizabeth, if he recalls it right. Adishan apologizes for calling her here so suddenly, but there were some urgent matters to attend to. Akalusha Elizabeth tells her to not worry, as she is always welcomed here. But why does she need to see Professor Secret so suddenly? That's when she notices Ronan, who is locked in and sweating bullets. She stares back at him with a defeated expression. To break the awkward atmosphere, Ronan explains that he was the one who asked to see the professor. Also, it has been a long time since they have met, so he greets her too. She starts screaming from the amount of embarrassment she is feeling right now, and asks why he is here. After everything is settled, they go and eventually arrive at the professor's office, which is a shabby cabin in the middle of the woods. Ronan finds it very suspicious, so he asks Eli if she is trying to bury him alive for what he saw back there. Elizabeth tells him to not call her Eli and know she will not bury him, so he should just follow and shut up already. Ronan does just that, but he is surprised that someone like her would be friends with the Grand Commander. But she was the original Akalusha in the first place, so the only question remains on how exactly they met. Elizabeth opens the door of the cabin, which reveals a lone granny standing in a rocking chair which makes Ronan wonder if this really is Professor's secret. Elizabeth tells him to not rush, as there is one more step to entering. They both approach the rather motionless granny, and Elizabeth is saying this just in case, but no matter what happens from this moment forth, he should remain motionless and not do anything foolish. Ronan agrees to those terms, so Elizabeth begins casting a long spell on the granny, which eventually ends with the word, open. A strange purple mist seeps out of the area, and suddenly, the motionless grandma becomes an enlarged head, which unhinges its jaw and sucks them in. Ronan is rightly quite shocked to see this, but Elizabeth tells him to not be afraid, as they are now entering the real office, Separaccio. Before Ronan can ask what the hell just happened, the professor floats behind him and says that he must be student Nabarose sent here. She suddenly approaches Ronan with a teleportation spell and touches Ronan's eye, while noting that it is just like Nabarose said. He truly has something that makes him very determined deep within him. This is the continent's best curse artist, Maya Secret, a being that has lived for 83 years and now finds Ronan quite interesting. Ronan looks at this person with a puzzled look, as he cannot believe that this kid is the professor of this place. Maya tells him to not be so surprised, as there are some personal circumstances to her look, but besides those, her body is over 80 years old. Ronan is even more surprised by that as there is a limit to how young a person can look once they get older. Yet she would fit as one of this academy's students quite easily. Maya says that they should talk about her beauty routine another time, as there is something more important at play here. With one snap of her fingers, Ronan is engulfed in strange runic lines that seem to seep out from inside of him. He asks what these are, and Maya is quite surprised to see that there are so many curses inside of a single body. Their origin is also strange, as it's closer to ancient magic than anything else, 
This situation is quite dangerous. Even a person with tons of great skill wouldn't dare to touch this. Ronan asks if this whole meeting is pointless if that's the case, but Maya tells him to relax, as even if the amount of curses are beyond what she anticipated, she naturally came prepared for anything. Suddenly a large symbol appears at Ronan's feet, and Maya explains that right now, she is going to materialize the curse within his body into his mind realm. What he does then is up to him, but he must do one thing in order to be free of the curse. Find its source and slice it. Ronan understands her words, but how is he supposed to know what to cut in the first place? Maya notes that he will know instinctively. She taps his head with one of her fingers and wishes him a safe trip. Ronan is pulled below into a dark realm, but eventually it changes and he is sent to a forest area. However, when he looks behind, he spots his house. Does that mean the source of the curse is inside of there? Out of nowhere, a little girl rushes past him and tells her mother that she's home. Ronan recognizes this voice, as it's of his sister's, Iris. When she gets inside, she starts looking at Ronan and finds him quite cute, but asks her mother why he is always sleeping like this. Is he sick, perhaps? The mother explains that babies grow while sleeping, so she was like this too when she was a baby. However, if her younger brother gets sick in the future, she should look after him, since she is his older sister. Iris agrees wholeheartedly, as she will protect him forever if she needs to. Ronan looks at this interaction and doesn't know what to say, as no matter how he swings it, this is their house, and this is what it looked like when he was born. Additionally, that baby that is in the cradle must be him. He does not like to see himself like this, as he thought that he was a pain to deal with as soon as he was born, so this image is not pleasant to him. Anyway, even if this is the past, he couldn't have remembered it, so why is he here? Suddenly, the door behind him opens with a slow creak, and from the outside comes a malevolent being that makes Ronan's heart almost stop in place. He cannot even move his body. Just who the hell is this mysterious figure? Iris rushes to hug the mystery figure, but he ignores her completely and presumably asks where Ronan is. The mother notes that he is in the cradle behind them. He must be curious about his appearance, right? That's when he pulls out some dark magic and says something intangible, but he knocks the mother out with a single dark spell. Iris rightly is confused and calls out for her mom, which makes Ronan turn around and see his older sister be put to sleep by the same dark spell that did their mother in. Ronan screams at the top of his lungs for him to stop, but this is just a memory. So the man moves on to him and pulls out the curses that he cast. With a bright light, he begins casting them, but this gives Ronan a target. It's him. The fucker he needs to slice is this bastard. Back in the real world, Maya finds it surprising as she did tons of preparations. But even so, she still used up all of her mana in a single spell. What this child has is truly unbelievable. Elizabeth is shocked to see the professor so defeated and asks just how many curses are cast on him. Maya can't say for sure, as there may be hidden ones somewhere, but for now, there are around 10 curses on him. Elizabeth is surprised, but notes that this must be why she is out of mana, because she is trying to lift 10 curses at once, right? Maya says otherwise as right now, she's only dealing with a single curse out of the many he has. The shadow figure finishes casting the curse on him and says something before leaving. He also looks at Iris one last time and with that walks away. The confinement that was put on Ronan is finally lifted once he leaves, so he rushes to his family to check up on how they are doing, but they are just sleeping, so he didn't do anything malicious to them. Ronan sighs in relief, but his mind is going in a thousand places now, so he needs to focus as he only needs to do one thing in this realm. He needs to kill that fucker. With a few slashes and a mighty charge, Ronan breaks through the door and gets to following the figure, but he is stopped dead in his tracks, as it seems that the figure was waiting for him. Ronan thinks that this means that this bastard must want something from him, yet he does not speak a word. Ronan asks how he dares to lay a finger on his family while he is there. He will never forgive him, no matter what. He rushes to the figure with rage-fueled eyes, but the figure calmly looks at his hand and creates a sword to defend himself with. They both start trading blows, but unfortunately, Ronan is being pushed back by the figure, and eventually he cuts him up really bad, which makes Ronan fall to his knees. Ronan doesn't accept this reality, as he hasn't been able to even scratch the figure with his sword, he just can't manage to reach him. He notices that the figure is walking away, but he cannot allow that, so he tells his body to stand up already, as he has something to ask him, no matter what. He manages to get up and say that this is not over yet. Why, why did he do what he did? Their expressions, tones, and actions, 
He knows that his family does not act that way to just anyone. He sensed the same affection that he gets when Iris looks at him. So that means he is that fucker, right? But why would he do something like that? The figure does not say a thing. Ronan clenches his sword tightly and notes that he made Mom and Iris sad. He even placed a curse on him. But he has no excuses or explanation to help his case. He charges in once again and asks how he still dares to call himself their father. The shadowy figure becomes clearer and looks at him with the same golden eyes that he has. Almost as if to say sorry and accepts his fate. Ronan cuts his head off with great force and once it falls to the ground, he strikes it again and again. If he doesn't want to talk, then so be it as he will just find everything out for himself. So he should get out of his body right now and leave like the bitch he is. Eventually, Ronan wakes from his slumber and finds himself still in the office. Maya comes from behind him and asks how he feels after that experience. But Ronan is too shocked to answer and asks who she is. However, seeing his attire, she must be Maya, who is now much older than he originally was. She congratulates him for his good senses but Ronan asks why she suddenly aged so fast, is it because of him? Maya tells him to relax, as this has nothing to do with what she did for him. Enough about him though, does he feel any different? Ronan says that he does, and if he's honest, he thought that she wasn't a normal person when he laid eyes on her. But now, he can tell that his thoughts were an understatement to say the least. Maya says that if he feels this way, then it means that everything has worked out just as he planned it to. They sit at a table and Ronan explains to Maya what happened in the mind realm. Maya is quite surprised, as it's rare to see a curse use the memories of a person they had no recollection of in order to create a background. He also thinks that the curse was placed by his own father, but why does he think that is? Ronan explains that it's the most likely thing, as he was able to hear the words that his sister and mother said to him. Also, when he put his family to sleep, he felt that something was off. However, it was too foreign to be his. It was a foreign feeling of sadness. Maybe that is why he was more riled up about the whole thing than ever before. If he thinks about it now though, with a clear head, those feelings might have been from his father. Maya notes that he also said that he had no recollection of his parents, right? Ronan confirms it, as both he and his sister have never doubted it. It is as if the memories in his mind were cut off entirely. Maya sips her tea, and thinks that it's not only his mana sense that was sealed, but part of his own existence was also done in. She explains to Ronan that his father most likely altered his memories too, and during the process, Part of his memories must have been transferred into him. Magic related to memories often have these kinds of side effects, and as such, the mind realm could have been made using his father's memories, rather than his. The reason he was able to use mana at the end may be due to the fact that it was upon recovering his lost senses that he was able to temporarily activate his mana sense. Ronan looks at his hand and notes that these shiny strands that are coming out of him must be mana, right? Maya confirms that it is. As of now, he can only see it, but one day he will be able to use it just like all of the students of this academy. If he can remove two of the nine curses he has, that is. Naturally, that will take time, since the curses are strong and from an unknown origin. For now, she will contact him when the preparations are done, so he should go back for today, since the sun is already starting to rise. Ronan is surprised to see her in her younger self again, so he asks if her body changes based on the time of day. She notes that she also has a strange body, just like he has, so she would rather not talk about it. She gets serious for a second and notes that he might be burdened by the harsh truth that will reveal itself with time, but he should stay collected, as the days ahead of him would be for nothing if he were to live in the past. Ronan agrees and bows down to her, as he will be relying on her from now on. Somewhere else, at the same time, in the Grand Carpadoki's basement, a man looks at the giant golem and notes that it's much bigger than the reports say. Even still, a student managed to hold off this thing alone, quite shocking to say the least. Another person approaches him from behind by the name of Dolan, and so the man asks how the recovery efforts are going. Dolan explains that it is progressing quite smoothly, so things should be back to normal in a week, give or take. Additionally, he looked into what they were doing according to his orders, but he was unable to find out anything that they already knew. However, Thanks to Filion, he was able to confirm the identity of the student that was at this scene here. Would he like to meet him in person, since he's the Duke? This man is the head of the Grancia Duke family, Joseph Sinivan de Grancia. Before he can answer, he notices that the golem behind him has started to move. Dolan apologizes for his rudeness, but could he leave this place for a bit, as he will have to take care of this. 
Joseph tells him it's not needed as they were in a hurry, so he will take care of this thing. With three swift sword movements, he cuts the golem into pieces and tells Nolan that they should go, as he wants to meet the young hero who saved this place. The next morning at the Naberdozer dormitory, Ronan is woken up by a loud knock on his door room, which he is very annoyed by, but when he opens he is met with Dolan's face, who he doesn't recognize, so he says that peddlers aren't allowed in the dormitories. Dolan notes that he's pretty rude, but does he even realize who he's being rude to right now? Ronan notices that he looks to be from some royal family, but besides that, the mana he is feeling around him is so dark to the point where it's kind of odd, but there's something else mixed in too, something which may not even be mana. Before he can deduct more, his thoughts are interrupted by Joseph, who tells Dolan that they are in the wrong for coming like this unannounced first thing in the morning, which Dolan agrees with and calls him the Duke. Ronan is shocked by this, and Joseph apologizes to him for his knight's foolishness, but could he spare them some of his time? Naturally, Ronan invites them inside, where Joseph presents Ronan with La Mancha's sheath, which was finished just yesterday. Ronan wonders why someone as important as him brought him this, but Joseph explains that the master craftsman of Carpadoki insisted on this, Master Daron specifically was quite thrilled. Besides that, however, he came here to express his gratitude, as the Grancia family and the Grand Carpadoki have a long-standing relationship. His personal blade, the Pale Road, was also made by Daron, so as a token of appreciation for the hero who saved Grand Carpadoki, he just wanted to express his gratitude, and naturally, that comes with a gift. Ronan is shocked by what he gets, a Grancia medallion and one with the Patriarch's seal, no less. He gladly takes it, but says that he could buy three villages with this if he wanted to. Is he sure this is okay? Joseph tells him to take it. It's only fitting for the savior to get this much. Naturally, the other students who helped him were also generously compensated, along with a lower-ranked medallion. He only hopes that it's enough. Ronan assures him that it's plenty, which Joseph is happy to hear. However, they should get to the point already. Can he speak about the person behind this incident? He has developed a certain interest in these evil deeds of theirs. As he says that, Ronan feels true power coming off of him. Truly, he is the head of the Grancia family. He explains that those dirty little rats are much more devious than he can predict. They are quick too, as it took him some time to track them. Before he can say anything further, he feels that same strange mana off of Dolan, which is now much stronger. It seems like he reacted to him talking about them. Now that he thinks about it, this feeling is very similar to what he faced when he fought those two fuckers. Does that mean this bastard is also one of them? Joseph asks why he suddenly stopped talking, which allows Ronan to find out that Joseph doesn't seem to be feeling what his subordinate is emanating, but he is one of the strongest people in the entire continent. How can he not see this? Perhaps only he can feel it. But if that's the case, he needs to test the waters. And so he asks Joseph if he knows about the star's advent, something which immediately gets a reaction out of Dolan. So he must try to provoke him further. He begins saying that their organization, Nebula Cluster, consists of children of the star. Joseph did not expect for such an organization to ever exist. But how did he get all of this information? Ronan says that before the instructor had arrived, he lightly cut them up, and so they started to talk. But he can't deny those idiots and the sight of them begging for his mercy were entertaining. But he must want to get into specifics here. Joseph stops him and says that it's fine. He will confirm the rest with the interrogator. As if he hears any more of this, he won't be able to have breakfast this morning. Ronan gives up on telling him, but there was no reason to tell more in the first place, as Dolan can't even control his aura at this point. Joseph says that it's time he went, but Ronan thinks that if they infiltrated the Garcia family, he must take some urgent measures against it. Before Joseph can depart, he stops him and says that there is something else he must know about these evildoers. But since there's a lot to discuss, and he doesn't want to keep him further, he will write a summary and send it by email. He is sure he will find it interesting, especially the part about a certain Ahayute. That evening, while Ronan is sleeping like a baby, the strange mana appears again, and Dolan tries to cut him down without prejudice. But before the blade can strike him, Ronan disappears and pops up above him, noting that it's nice to meet him so late in the evening. Before Dolan can ask how he knew, Ronan points out that he should take a look there first, as he invited a special guest to this event just for him, that guest being Schlieffen, who demands an explanation right now. A few hours earlier, Ronan went to tell Schlieffen about Dolan, and naturally he didn't believe him at first, as Dolan had no reason to prepare an ambush. He is one of Grancia's top knights in both skill and loyalty, and he was appointed as his father's guard just four years after becoming a knight in the family. Ronan said that if it was for four years, his family is fucked, but whatever, he can come see it for himself, as he's got nothing to lose anyway, and if he's right, he will get rid of a rat bastard who infiltrated the family. Schlieffen demands an explanation once again, this time with his unsheathed blade pointing towards Dolan, 
Ronan asks why a traitor like him would just answer nicely. Truly, he is far too naive. With one large step, Dolan releases a bunch of electrifying mana that makes Ronan's body feel much heavier and distracts him from the attacking Dolan, who manages to send him away with only a few attacks. Schlieffen asks why he is doing something like this, but then Dolan charges him too and tells him that it's nice he did not master controlling his mana. Considering his personality, he would not use such a powerful skill in an area where other people can get swept into it. Even so, it is unfortunate that their relationship ended like this, as he didn't want it to. That damn child ruined everything. Schlieffen notices that his skills are different from what he remembers. Why has he been hiding his real skills? Why has betrayed the family like this? Dolan says that it's not a betrayal, as he has never been a part of the Grancian family to begin with. As he goes to strike Schlieffen down, he says that he understands with a defeated voice and will now let him do as he wishes. That's when Ronan appears in front of Dolan and blocks his attack completely. Ronan says that he is truly an annoying kid, but he must feel better now, right? Schlieffen apologizes, but it was important that he made sure this is what it was. However, now that he has found out, he will make sure that a bloodbath will happen in Grancia. Dolan can't believe that he can endure his mana at full capacity and still has enough power to wield his blade in such a manner. Just how much mana does this guy have? Was he also hiding his power? But there's no reason to do that, meaning that he grew stronger within that short period of time. As he thinks of how that is even possible, Ronan appears in front of him and says that he must be pretty bored, so he will help alleviate some of it. He starts beating on Dolan, who notices that he is as strong as Schlieffen, so he dodges an attack and kicks Ronan away. He then looks for a way of escape, which he eventually finds and swiftly gets out of the building, as the professors will surely be coming by now. He damns his emotions, as it led him into this situation where his cover was blown and he almost got beaten. He must hide for now. That's when Schlieffen appears behind him and says that he's right. Unlike his father, he is still lacking in his skills as he can't use Tempest Sword properly. But like the fool he is, he ran into an open field where he can use Tempest Sword without worry of hitting others. With that, Schlieffen unleashes the Grancia family secret technique on him, which he tries to defend at first, but the amount of power is far too much for him. So with his last thoughts, he prays to his dear star. Schlieffen gets on the ground and says that from this day forward, nobody will remember who he is in the family. But that doesn't matter, as he was never a part of it in the first place. Ronan comes around and says that he dealt with this traitor harshly. He must have been pretty angry, huh? Won't the state he left him in kill him though? He should have kept him alive for interrogation. Schlieffen says that he only severed his tendons. Theoretically, he won't die. Anyways, things are now fine because of him. So he will go and inform the household about this, as they need to track down all of the traitors that have potentially infiltrated. So he will leave it to him. With that he runs away, which makes Ronan scream at him as he destroyed literally everything around them, and now he expects him to just handle things. That's when a golden portal appears behind him, and out of it comes Nabiros, who asks if he's injured anywhere, as they saw a storm come from around here. She is also accompanied by the headmaster, but Ronan notices that Nabiros is still in her pajamas, so he says that they are very thematic but Nabiros urges him to answer the damn question already. The headmaster agrees that they can discuss PJs later, and it's a real relief that he was not harmed. But can he explain what happened here? Ronan agrees, but before he does that he has something to say. A Hayute is the son of a bitch bastard rat who deserves death. The headmaster is quite confused by his words, meaning that he is not part of those cultists. The next day at the headmaster's office, he gets the information from Ronan that Grancia had traitors inside of it. This issue is much more dangerous than he thought, but again, thanks to his service, he kept the situation from becoming even worse. Ronan says that it's nothing, while also thinking that he kept that he can see special mana hidden from them, as he can't be certain it is what he thinks it is. And if this information were to leak out, everyone around him would be put in danger. The headmaster says that this incident will be investigated with the Grancia family in the middle. But enough about that, as the Empire is indebted to him again, so he feels that he needs to reward him. Is there anything he would like? Ronan was waiting for an opportunity like this, as there is something that he wanted to do at school, but it can be done only with his approval. The headmaster agrees to see what he wants to do at least. The next day, in the Grand Plaza of Filion, Ronan places himself near a board and tells everyone to listen, as he knows that their school activities happen only at school. So he created this for everyone. It's called the Special Adventure Club. Someone asks what that is, and Ronan says that it's a great question. It is a constructive club with external activities that mostly focus on fighting so that they can reveal their true talents and serve the Empire well. Since he got the Grandmaster's approval, they are the only club that can go out of Filion, so if they want to join they should drop by the first arena. During interviewing hours, a strange woman looks at him while he speaks and wonders if it's that guy that she needs. 
After a few hours at the interviewing place, Ronan is quite mad that he tried to recruit many talents, but in the end, only these two managed to survive until the last day of the interviews. Asel and Maria, who explains that it's because his so-called reviews were separated into two difficult tasks. One was the verification trial where he beat everyone up, and the second one was that those who survived had to sign a contract, pledging their entire life to the club. Asel says that she heard rumors about their club already, that if one joins they would need at least 10 lives to do anything worthwhile. Ronan says that they are just weaklings but it's fine, as what he needs is some real promising individuals, like this one in front of him. It appears that Ronan had one last candidate, who wanted to fight him even though he would have been accepted, but he tells the guy, Brahm, that he passed this too. However, he will let him know in advance that the club activities will be quite tiring, so he hopes that's fine with him. Brahm says that this is what he is here for in the first place. He wants to grow stronger. With that, he tells the others to leave and rest before their first activity, as he will stay here and wait since there is still some time left. Someone might actually come. Day turns to night, yet nobody shows up. Only the crickets are here. Ronan gives up and thanks Adishan for coming here when she had time, as she was a huge help, which she was glad to do. But it's a shame as if she wasn't the assistant instructor she would have tried to join too. Ronan can't tell her that even if she did try out, he would refuse, as she needs to decide slowly whether she will give up on her dream or not. He will leave it up to her, as he can't force her. That's when the strange woman appears, and says that it's a relief he is still here, making Ronan think that this person is here for the club tryouts. The woman says something in a raspy office which Ronan doesn't understand, so he asks her to repeat. As she uncloaks herself, she asks, if she joins the club, can she touch it? Ronan is confused at first, but then said that he will not let her conduct shameful acts on his body. She wasn't referring to him, however. She was referring to the little creature on his shoulder. As Ronan pets Sita, he notes that he misunderstood her at first, but this little thing is always with him no matter what, so if she joins the club, she will be able to touch him. Ronan also thinks that she's a strange person, as he did not sense her approach until she got too close. She's not a normal student, that's for sure, so she must be the real deal. The mysterious girl ponders for a second, and then asks what she needs to do for the interview. So Ronan asks her to show what she can do on that magic doll, and also say her grade and name. As she unleashes her mighty power, she introduces herself as a magic major junior, Ophelia DeKnight, and with that she begins. Adishan is shocked to see dark attribute magic, with Ronan also being surprised that she can control that dark mana almost perfectly. Besides that, there is something else he can feel a red energy coming out of her mana points. From the center of the mana, even Sita feels it. With her mana gathered, Ophelia uses Shadow Claw to completely engulf and blow up the dummy, something that creates a lot of dust. Even with this, Ronan can still see what she did to the dummy, and says that there's no need for a duel, as she has successfully passed. As he goes to ask her something, Ophelia uses telepathy to speak to him, and notes that he must have seen it, but he should keep it a secret for now as things will become troublesome if others were to find out, but now they should move somewhere else as she has something to ask of him. With that, they go somewhere more secluded, where as promised, Ronan lets her touch Sita, and finds out that he's a dream bird, which she finds quite interesting. Ronan says that she's even more interesting, as he heard that they left quite a long time ago. Vampires, he means. Ophelia explains that not everyone left the Empire, and it's true that they are few, but they are still scattered through the Empire. However, most live in hiding since they don't like tiresome activities, so Ronan figures that the reason she approached his club in spite of that is because of Sita's mana. She confirms that it is, as when she first saw him at the plaza, she felt the energy of blood magic, her species magic. Ronan was actually wondering about it, but it seems that Sita really has vampiric abilities. However, the first thing he did after getting out of the egg was absorb blood, so yeah. Ophelia is extremely shocked to find out that he used magic like that from the get-go, but then wonders how many years it's been since he was born. Three years, or at least five, right? Ronan says that it might have been two months at most, which Ophelia is amazed by, as he is already exuding blood mana of very high density. If that is true, then what she really wants might be possible. She instantly starts hyper-talking and says that she wants something from them. She was going to just leave after seeing Sita, but if she has her request fulfilled, she will work hard. Though now she needs to do some research. After that, she promises to be included in all group activities. Ronan stops her and asks, what research is she talking about? The next day, at Nest, the Fillion club room area, Ronan and the others arrive at the Special Adventure Club, which is quite a big building. Ronan is pleasantly surprised by this, and says that the headmaster was really generous. But he also notices that something changed with Asel and Maria, as they both have things from Carpadoki. Joseph must have sent them, right? They confirm it, and Maria notes that she got a great sword since she wanted to switch up her style from dual swords and see how it goes. Asel got a magic bracelet, 
Made with materials from the magic city, Delphium, it also helps her mana and power increase. Ronan is glad for both of them, but says that they should get inside, as they will have a pretty important conversation. Inside of the building he explains that they have only one goal, to improve their latent abilities as swiftly as possible through real life experiences, but he's the only one that needs to know it's actually for that day. He points at a map and says that this is their first exploration zone, as this mountain range hasn't been fully discovered by the Empire. So the Vadian Mountains will be a good place to get experience, since it will be unusual. Additionally, he also has some personal things to do there, but that isn't the most important thing, as there's a problem with these two that needs solving. Instead of explaining what it is, Ronan tells them to come outside, as they will have a sparring session. As they walk to the training room, Ronan mentions to them that the problem they have is that they haven't completed their modules yet, something which they need to do. If they leave, they will do so for about a week at least, but they have classes, and it will be difficult to juggle both of them. He is also sure that the headmaster will not allow it, so the solution is pretty simple. They need to finish their classes early like he did, and become as free as a summer bird. When they arrive at the training room, Ronan notes that before training them individually, he will assess their skills, so they should come at him, as he promises to only use the sheath for them. However, it won't be fun if they are relaxed, so they better do their best, or else. Maria doesn't feel too comfortable with him, but this is an opportunity to test that out. They should show him just how much they have grown. Acel understands what she's trying to say and promises to do her best as she uses magic to support Maria. With that, she charges in with a heavy attack, which pleases Ronan, but why did she hit the floor with it? That's when he notices that Acel is using her magic to pick up the rubble and starts to throw it at Ronan, who is pleased with her telekinesis control, but he will not allow himself to be hit. As he removes her attacks, however, Maria appears behind him and tells him to dodge if he knows what's good for him. Ronan does just that as the attack lands to the ground, with him also being amazed at the amount of power she put into this one attack. She isn't finished, however, and starts to swing at him, but he starts pushing her back with his heavier blows. Before he can do anything else, however, he looks above and sees a cell, who just ripped a huge chunk of the arena out and is now throwing it at Ronan while telling Maria to dodge. Instead of dodging the attack, Ronan meets it with his unsheathed sword and cuts it into tiny little pieces, but he is amazed by their growth. They have really improved quite a lot, meaning that they weren't just playing around all of this time. Especially Acel, her new abilities are simply amazing, it's like she's a whole other person. With that, he ends the test and notes that two weeks should be enough in order for them to be ready, so they should begin right now. They both say that they just finished sparring, but Ronan doesn't care, and immediately starts whipping them into shape. From that day onwards, Acel and Maria have commenced their special training, something which caused them to lose a lot of sleep. Two weeks later, as promised, Ronan hands the headmaster all of their early completion certificates. He explains that it's not for all subjects, but this should be enough to let them go out. The headmaster is surprised that they managed to do it, but as he promised, they are allowed to leave, so he wishes them a safe journey. The next day, the first activity of the Special Adventure Club starts in the Vadian Mountains. Maria is surprised by how pure the mana is out here, and Brahm feels it too, but he notes that this will make training easier. He also asks Ronan what they will do, who says that they are still far from the core, so when they arrive, he will let them know. But he will tell them this, that they need to find a little something. Somewhere deep in the forest, the wind whispers to an elf that there are visitors, so he decides to greet them, as he hasn't had guests in quite some time. Eventually the party arrives where they wanted to be, at an orc encampment. Brahm finds it amazing that the orcs actually managed to create a village, which Ronan confirms that in these secluded areas, things like this can happen. Even though this is just a village now, these bastards are pretty fertile so soon enough the entire mountain range will be covered in orcs. The people in the vicinity will suffer when that happens, so to nip the problem in the bud, they will fight them. Pretty simple, right? Acel is surprised that they are actually going to fight them, since they are so many. But Ronan assures her that everything will be fine, while noting that there is a variable to think about, that being the dominant species of this place, the ogres. These guys will not do anything to those giants, and especially the leader of the bunch, the twin-headed ogre, was so strong that even he had trouble with him in his past life. However, it's not like he will appear now, so he shouldn't be a problem. Before they can jump in, the elf appears behind them and says that even with pure intentions, they should not go and do that. It is not the right time to do that. Ronan is extremely surprised that he didn't feel him until he spoke, but the elf tells them to not be on guard, as he is a simple priest that stays in the mountain. Ronan asks what kind of priest, and so the priest explains that he serves an ancient spirit with the divine name, Senial, though now they should move somewhere else so that they can converse properly. Before he can even finish his sentence, 
Ronan pulls out his sword and aims it squarely at his neck. He apologizes for his behavior, but he needs to make sure of something, so he should copy what he says. Ah you, you dog bastard! Naturally, the priest is struck with confusion. After the confusion is aired out, they follow the priest who notes that as someone who serves a deity, it was pretty embarrassing for him to say those words. He must admit thought it was a bit thrilling considering it's been 200 years since he spoke like that. Ronan tells him that he did great, but just how old is he now? The elf says that he stopped counting after some time, but he's probably over a thousand years old by now. Everyone is shocked by this, and thinks that this guy has been around well before the Empire's foundation, perhaps even more than that. He also asks what he meant by this not being a good time to kill the orcs, which he begins explaining. The monster's different actions have been puzzling recently, as the orcs who are not nocturnal go around the mountain range every night, while the ogres who do not leave their set territory started to explore the outskirts. Since they have not found the cause yet, it will be good for them to be careful, so they should relax a bit, inside of this place, Senyul's temple. Brahm notes that this must be barrier magic, for the temple to just appear like this, and Acel assesses that a barrier of this scale is much greater than any of their instructors. She also asks Ronan if he knew about this, but he notes this is his surprised face, though he also thinks that this guy is by no means a normal elf. When they go inside, they all see the senial that the elf serves, which is a really rough rock. The elf says that it has other meaning to it despite its appearances, but he will only bore them with that story so they should unpack and get comfortable, as there are many rooms in the temple. Maria then remembers that he should ask him about the place they are looking for, meaning the cursed eye habitat. The elf wonders why they are looking for such a monstrous place. Is it perhaps because of the curse that is cast upon him? Ronan is surprised that he knows, with the elf explaining that the dangerous vibrations around him were what gave it away, but they should go and talk somewhere privately. They go to a secluded place where the elf says that the moment he saw him, he knew that he wasn't a normal student something which Ronan answers with half a mouth, as he thinks that he was swept up in this without thinking. Is he just being too sensitive right now? Is this man really unrelated to those star-obsessed bastards? He does not sense any mana from him, and he didn't react at a Hayute's name drop, so he must be fine. The elf notices that he's deep into his mind, and tells him to drink this tea, as it will surely help. Once the tea's scent starts to engulf him, he looks back at the elf and sees an incredible flow of mana coming from him. The elf asks how he finds the tea's scent. Is it to his liking? As Ronan feels true mana all over, he notes that it's like his pupils were refreshed. Just what is in this tea? The elf explains that it's a mix of herbs that rarely grow into the mountain range, and it pierces through blocked veins and revitalizes senses. It is not so special that he can feel the effects only after one cup, but because of his curse, this might seem like something amazing to him. Since that's the case, he will pack him some so that he can have it regularly only under the condition that he stops using the cursed eye to detoxify himself. While that thing does get rid of the curse, it also eats at his life force. So if he uses it repeatedly, his life will soon be at risk. He must not know that, right? Ronan confirms that he did not. He just wanted to rid of the curse, which the elf fully understand. But he must not hasten this, as it will take time. And if he makes a mistake, just one, he cannot take it back. Ronan looks back at the tea and thinks that it's like Secret told him that the curse is hard to detoxify, and that many preparations would be needed. Even after that, when he met that guy, he felt rushed, something which could have ended up doing him more damage than good, but thanks to this guy, he was able to prevent it. However, he feels strangely familiar. Ronan says that he felt rushed because of all the fanatics going around, the stars advent people, who are some strange people. The elf thinks about this, and knows about these people, but how are they able to make moves again? At night, he stands at the rock formation and thinks that if those religious people Ronan mentioned are who he thinks they are, they will soon take the lives of innocents, and a great calamity will befall this land. Will he really be forced to watch again, or will that child give him enough courage to push forward? Ronan comes around and doesn't expect to see him awake, calling him Sarante. He asks why he is up himself, and Ronan says that he's here for some water. But looking at this place again, it is truly fascinating. Does this boulder really represent God? Sarante explains that every thousand years his order moves a thousand boulders to the Empire's most remote area. In that place, there is always rain, so most boulders do not last longer than 200 years. They wear away and disappear. Despite that, the ones that survive this trial will transcend and prove their will. The soul within them becomes a clear representation of Senyal. Ronan is surprised that it's so deep, but if that's the case, where are the other priests of this place? Sarante explains that everyone has circumstances, and devoting one's entire life on a god that will never answer is hard. Even he had his doubts, but something made him stay every time. Perhaps it was the will of Senyal, 
or the hope that one day someone will come around and save the world because of her. That to him is like fate, something which he couldn't just pass out to someone, and that time is very near. The next day, they officially organized, with the others also taking the tea, and trained their mana sensitivity with it. While they did that, Ronan helped with the foraging and exploring of the mountain, but he was surprised by Sarante's kindness, as they had just met, but he was really genuine. These two peaceful days passed without anything happening, but as always, tragedy always appears unexpected, and it is swift in its dispersing of despair. The day of the village orc raid, Sarante was quite worried for the team as the monsters were abnormal, but Ronan assured him that it's fine as because of him, and the training they did they have become strong, with the others also agreeing. Additionally, the trip timer was over, so they had to go back to school. Sarante noted that if it can't be helped, he will at least give them access to the barrier. With this they can enter freely, so if they feel any danger, they should not hesitate to return, and never let their guard down as the forest is beautiful, but it is also deep and crude. In a dark place hundreds of orcs are dead, as a woman with a sharp blade walks around and says that person is hard to find, but she can't rely on dumb beasts anymore, so she will go meet that bastard elf herself. Eventually, Ronan and the party arrive back at the orc village, where the orcs are relishing in their spoils with newly acquired clothes and jewelry that they know nothing about. Ronan can only come to one conclusion, that they raided a nearby village, so he tells the others to get ready, as he will not allow these beasts to tarnish their lands any longer. Two orcs start talking, with one complimenting the other's necklace, as it looks good on him. The other orc says that it belonged to a kid from the village they raided, which was quite annoying, as he kept whining while he was being beaten to death. He could barely hear because of that. Suddenly, with the help of a cell, Brahm and Maria jump down the mountain, with the orcs being quite confused by their sudden appearance. Before they can even move a single muscle, they are both cut up in bits by the two, with the other orcs noticing the commotion, so they all get ready for bloody combat. They start charging in, but that's when a boulder hurls into one's head and knocks him out in a second. The one next to him is quite confused, but that's when a boulder crashes into his head too, completely erasing it from this world. Ronan congratulates Acel for her accuracy, as she must have gotten pretty proficient with her now. As they both float off the ground, Ronan tells Acel to destroy them completely, which she reluctantly agrees with, and brings down a rocky calamity upon the orcs, who all want to run away. After that is done and the dust clears, Acel looks at what she did, and thinks that she will surely receive divine retribution for this awful sight. Ronan tells her not to worry about such things, as if she would receive it, they will all receive it too. He asks Brahm to back him up, which he does, as he will be with her till the end, but it's pretty obvious that she will receive the biggest punishment out of all of them for this massacre. Ronan thinks that it was a grand idea to bring everyone here, as they got a chance to show their true skills in a real fight, some battle experience is always worth it. That's when Sita pushes his face and tells him that there is something over in that direction, and when Ronan looks to see what it is, both him and Acel spot an injured and tied up elf. Ronan immediately goes to untie her as he orders Sita to use healing magic on the elf, which slowly wakes the elf up, who is surprised by the mana she is feeling around them. Before she can do anything though, she starts to cough up blood, with Ronan being surprised that Sita's healing did not work. The elf, with bated breath, asks if they are from the shrine, and when Ronan shows an ounce of approval, she grabs him and tells him to take her to that man. As they are coming, they do not have any time left. Sarante and the shrine are in immediate danger. Before she can say anything more, she passes out completely. As Sarante is clearing around the shrine, Ronan rushes in with the injured elf and Sarante asks what happened. Ronan tells him to look after this elf, as she was a prisoner they saved from the orc village, and she seems to desperately want to meet him. When Sarante looks at her, he is quite confused, but then he remembers who she is. Brigia, just what happened to her. The others were left behind with Maria and Brahm looking around in their respective areas, but both of them found nothing. It seems like the elf was the only prisoner. Maria says that they should go back too, but that's when she notices a cell and asks what's wrong. She explains that there's something strange about these orcs, as they did not have these things before. Maria agrees, and asks if she knows anything about them, which she doesn't, as it seems that they were hidden with double magic up until now, but just what do these magic circles do? Thank you for watching. See you next time.